What's up developers and welcome back to a new video where we will be kicking off a new course on this channel which is Symphony. Quick pause. Do you want to support the channel and want me to continue on creating content? You can support the channel on Patreon right now where you can get benefits such as a private discord group where you can share your coding issues and other developers who will help you out. If you are interested to join, the link will be in the description down below. I have created this course to teach people one of the best PHP framers which is Symphony. But the course is not everything. But that's something that you need to realize as well. You need to put time into Symphony if you want to become great at it. It's the dedication that you have to put in to learn something. And that's the advice that I want to give you before we start this journey together. Many people ask me when am I ready to learn a framework. And I do understand where the question is coming from since there are many obstacles along the way. I could sit here and tell you a lie that you need to watch this entire course and turn off your ad blocker of course, but I won't. You do need to have some knowledge before you get into this course, so let's go over the things I expect you to know before you start off with this course. It is important to have a bit experience in front-end technologies like HTML and CSS. JavaScript is not a must, but would be fine if you do have some experience with it. For the CSS part, we will be using a CSS framework called Tailwind CSS, which is something I fell in love with over the last couple of years. It's not difficult to learn Tailwind, you will definitely get used to it during this course, but I've also got a separate course regarding Tailwind, which is linked in the description down below. The most important skill that you need to have is obviously PHP, and specifically object-oriented programming. We will be using terms like extents, classes, interfaces, objects, scope, and accessibility. I will cover them quickly, but on a very basic level. Besides that, you do need to have a good understanding of MVC. You don't need to be able to create an MVC structure with your eyes closed, but you do need to know the concepts behind of it. You should know that a controller handles logic, sends data back to the view, and a model interacts with the database and so on. Now what is Symfony? Everyone that's here watching these videos might be here for a different reason. One might be completely done with PHP and want to learn something new, or you want to make your development process a little bit easier by learning Symfony. Before we dive into coding or me showing you what the difference is between the different PHP frameworks, let's take it a step backwards and talk about Symfony itself. If someone asks me to describe Symfony in just one sentence, I usually say that Symfony is a full stack PHP framework that uses a set of reusable components. In my opinion, the usage of a framework is very beneficial since it allows you to use so many tools that will help you to improve productivity. And those are the two words you'll hear from pretty much everyone when it comes up to frameworks. It will improve your productivity. Whether you're a starter working for a company or a freelancer working on projects, it will cost you a lot of time to create an application from scratch every single time. And that's where a framework such as Symfony comes into play. I'm not the type of person that wants to rank frameworks by saying that Laravel is better than Symfony or Symfony is better than Codeigniter. I just want to share some advantages of using a framework such as Symfony. Not compared to Laravel or Codeigniter, but compared to plain PHP. Now the first one is faster development. Before frameworks ever existed, writing web applications did differ a lot than it does today. Nowadays we have a ton of frameworks that makes it easy to create web applications since everything is predefined. The second advantage is components. With the usage of any framework, you're using pre-packed collections of third-party components. Think about a configuration file, service container, prescribed directory structures, and so on. Finally, you can reuse pieces of code. If we think about an application that is entirely built in PHP, you need to think about a lot of little things. Think about your HTTP request, router, configuration, or how to load views or controllers. These are all points that you start thinking about when you work on a project on your own. Every single programming language has its own set of coding standards. Most of them will be equal to another, but there are some slight changes here and there. I want to start off by showing you some basic naming conventions and structures that we'll be using during this course, and it's probably something you will be using your entire career. Most of them will speak for itself, but I don't want to leave you mind blown later on when I do something that we haven't talked about. The reason why coding standards are developed is not only to make it easier for you, but also for any other developer that might look at your code in a later phase. Also, a quick note, these coding standards are not created by myself, but they are from the official website of Symphony. So it's not that I made them up, but they are all out there on the web, and I will link them in the description down below. I'm not going over them in depth, because if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, 
you will understand most of them. Now the first one is to add a space after each comma delimiter. Whether you define array items or properties, you will need to add a space after each delimiter. The second one is to add a single space around binary operators. Binary operators are things like the double equal sign, the double ampersand sign, double pipe bar. Whenever you define them, make sure that you add a single space around them so that you see what the delimiter is and what the value of it is. The third one is to use braces to indicate control structures bodies. This one speaks for itself. You need to use your braces, so your curly braces, when you want to indicate control structure bodies. Then we need to define one class per file. So whenever you want to work with multiple classes, make sure that you create a separate file for them. Don't add multiple classes in one .php file extension. Number five is to declare properties before methods. Methods are actions and properties are qualities. And property returns information about an object that you might want to use inside a method. So make sure that you declare your properties first before you declare your methods. Number six is to declare methods in the following order. Place your public methods at the beginning, followed by your protected methods, and then your private methods. Next to the structure coding standards, we also got naming conventions. It is very important to use camel case, so the first letter is a lowercase, and every word after starts with a capital. Now keep in mind that you need to use them for variables, functions, methods, and arguments. Use snake cases, so a underscore with all lower cases, for configuration parameters and twig templates. We will be using something which is called namespaces, and namespaces should always be Pascal case. So every first letter of a word should be uppercase, including the first one. Whenever you're going to use interfaces, traits, or exceptions, they should all start off with a capital. So interface should start with a capital I of interface, traits with a capital T, exceptions with a capital E. There are several ways on how you could approach this course. You could say, well, there are loads of other courses out there with more videos and more time, but is that really the key? I like to keep my courses short and to the point. Not every single topic in Symfony will be a separate video because you'll be using certain elements within a different video. If we take a look at our global course overview, we will start with the introduction, where we're in right now, followed with the installation and configuration, followed with the controllers and routes, views and assets, databases and doctrine. We're going to create a project and build on that. Then we're going to dive into authorization and authentication. We're going to write a unit test, followed by mailing and notifications. Early in the day, web development was totally different. Next to the components, developers were responsible for writing the code for the business logic as well. Most of you guys know that there are loads of frameworks and libraries available, which will make your life a lot easier. With PHP, you will be using a lot of components and packages. And why not? Because there are so many available. Frameworks like Symfony and Laravel prepackage a collection of third-party components together with custom frameworks. Well, what will that be? Think about things like configuration files, service providers, prescribed directory structures, and application bootstraps. This all will define the benefit of using a framework. Someone has already made decisions not just about individual components for you, but also about how those components should fit together. Now then, we have our source code. The source code of this tutorial will be available through GitHub, as you can see on my screen right now. You can find my GitHub attached at the beginning of every single video. We will most likely have the same interface, and in the top left corner you'll see something which is called main, with a drop down menu attached to it. The main repository will be basically all branches that we got. Now every single video has its own branch, as you can see right here. So from video 5, we will start creating code. As you can see, there's also a pattern right here. It starts with a number, followed with the title of each video. So if you only need the source code of, let's say, video 7, you could simply click on 7 of route parameters. And right here, you will find all source codes related to video 7. Now in my GitHub, you will also find something which is called a readme down below. And this will basically be a summary of every single video in text. Let me show it right here. So we got chapter one, introduction to Symfony, what we're doing right now, how you should use this course. Let's scroll down. What do we have more? MVC explained, setting up Visual Studio Code, setting up our project in directory explained, and so on. Once you're tired of my voice, which I can understand at some point, 
you can easily open my GitHub, scroll down to any chapter that you need, and you will basically find what we've talked about in the tutorial. Most developers will agree with me that you develop your skills by running into issues and finding the solutions yourself. How I like to work is showing you both the happy path and the unhappy path. If you don't agree with that, you will find out later in your career that knowing the unhappy path is a life changer. Next to that, if there are multiple ways on solving an issue, I'll be showing you them as well. And I'm also giving a recommendation of what you should use. That being said, this was it for this video where we went over the basics of Symfony, talked about how you should approach this course and why you should be using a framework. In the previous video, I've touched on MVC a bit and I said that it is definitely important to have a decent understanding of MVC. In coding, MVC is a design pattern or a software architecture which stands for three layers, the model, the view, and the controller. When using MVC, you will structure your application by separating the domain, application, and business logic from the rest of your user interface. Before we dive into the connection between the layers, let's dive into them separately first. The first one is the M of model. The model layer manages the fundamental behaviors and data of the application. It can interact with the requests from user input fields, respond to instructions, and even notify observers in event-driven systems. Then we got the view. The view is probably the easiest one because it's the user interface of your application. What you'll be doing is pulling in data from the database in the model and translating it into data that you can use in the view. Next up is the controller. And the controller will take HTTP requests, so user inputs from the browser, and gets the right data out of the database, validates user input, and eventually sends a response back to the user. In the model, you don't want to use view or controller code. The other way around as well, you don't want to perform SQL queries inside your controller, let alone in your view. All these components are defined as the MVC design pattern. In my personal opinion, Symfony is huge because it's using the MVC design pattern. Well, let me rewind that. Symfony contains the MVC framework, but it does not constrain it. This might have been a lot of information on your plate already. So let's look at a small example. Think about an e-commerce. Well, you have the user that wants to buy a product. He will start off by looking at a view, probably press on a button to add a product to his shopping cart, which will then interact with the controller by sending an HTTP request using the browser of the user. What the controller will do then is responding to the request by interacting with the model. It will basically say, well, hey model, can you send me information about this specific product? Then the controller has some value stored somewhere, which then can be sent back to the view. Finally, the product will be displayed back to the user. Don't get hung up on MVC too much, since you'll be learning it along the way. This will at least give you a simple approach to the rest of this course as we talked about views, controllers, and models. The first part of this video is based for Mac users. If you are interested in learning how to set up everything properly for Windows or Linux, I recommend you reading through the documentation I've put on my GitHub. Once you start learning Symfony, I kind of expect you to already have PHP and MySQL installed. If you have done that, you don't need to follow the first part of this course, but you can skip forward to the section where we install Composer. Also, you can install the same tools that I'm installing through Brew, since it will be exactly the same for Windows and Linux through their official website. Since Symfony is created with PHP, we obviously need to make sure that we have PHP installed. I have deleted everything from our local machine to do it from scratch. PHP can be installed through different ways. You can set up XAMPP, but I personally prefer to use Homebrew. Homebrew is a third-party package that manages your applications on Apple operating systems. As you can see, I'm currently located on the official website of Homebrew, which is homebrew.sh. And right on our screen, you'll see a section where they are telling us how we can install Brew on our local machine. As you can see, it can be done through a bin bash command. So what we can do is to click on the icon that we have right here to copy the entire line of code, which needs to be pasted inside the terminal. So I've already got my terminal installed and open, and every Mac device has one as well, as you can see right now. Mine looks a bit fancier than yours, but it will do the same exact thing. Now what we can do inside the terminal is basically Command V to paste the line of code that we just copied and hit enter. It's asking us for a password, so let's simply add it. 
hit enter. It's telling us what it will be installing. And you have the option to go back right now, but we don't, so let's hit enter. And it's installing everything right now. And Homebrew is a very big software package. So this might take a while. So pause the video and I'll see you back once it's done. All right, as you can see, brew has been installed for me. So what I want to do right now is to run a command called brew help to double check if everything has been set up correctly. As you might have noticed, the command does work, so brew has been installed. I don't want to dive into brew because it could be an entire course for itself. But what I want to do right now is to install PHP through homebrew. Most of you guys might have PHP installed since it is a requirement before diving into learning Symfony. Therefore, you can simply double check it by performing the PHP double dash version command. As you can see, my terminal returned a message right here saying that the command PHP has not been found, meaning that I have no PHP installed on my local machine. It's super easy in Brew to install packages. You need to start off by writing down the keyword Brew, followed with the action that you want to perform. In our case, we're going to install something. So let's say space install. Then you need to specify what you want to install. Once again, we're trying to install PHP right here. So let's say space PHP. Let's hit enter. And this might take a minute as well. Once again, pause the video and I'll see you back once it's done. With the new release of Symfony 6, PHP 8.0.2 or higher is required when you want to run your Symfony projects. There are also some other tools that you need to have installed for Symfony, such as C-Type, IconV, PCRE, Session, Simple XML, and Tokenizer. But don't worry, this will all be handled once you install PHP. All right, as you can see, it has been finished. And if I scroll up, you'll see that right here, PHP has been added with a version of 8.1. Now, if this hasn't been outputted for you, you can simply run PHP space double dash version. And right here, you will see that version 8.1.0 has been installed on my local machine. Now, let's say that a new PHP version comes out in the future and you want to upgrade your PHP version. Well, that can simply be done through Brew as well by saying Brew Upgrade PHP. If I run it right now, I'm getting a warning saying that PHP 8.1.0 has already been installed. Now, the next tool that we need to install is obviously MySQL. I'm personally not a huge fan of using PHP my admin, so let's install that through Brew as well. You simply need to perform the Brew command again. We're going to install something which is called MySQL. I'm not going to hit enter since it will overwrite all databases that I currently have. So be aware of that. Since I'm also working on some real life projects, I want you to run this command if you have not installed MySQL. Once you have installed MySQL, you can perform the MySQL command to get access to your databases. If you have a password on your laptop or PC, it will most likely ask for it the first time. Next to PHP and MySQL, we will be using a package manager called Composer. Composer might be weird once you start using it for the first time, but once it clicks, you will see how incredible it is. Now you can install Composer through Brew, but since Windows and Linux need to install it as well, we can make use of their official documentation and website. So let's navigate back to the browser, and let's change the URL to getcomposer.org. Alright, and let me zoom in. Now on the landing screen, you'll see their logo. It says that it's a dependency manager for PHP and we have a download button. So let's click on it. It's simply telling us what we need to do. We have these four PHP lines of codes that we need to run inside the CLI. But if we scroll down, you will see a option right here where you can manually install it. Personally, I'm not a big fan of this since it takes a while. So let's scroll up, copy these four lines of code, navigate back to the CLI, exit MySQL, and right here, let's command V it and let's hit enter. It's telling us that Composer 2.1.14 has successfully been installed. We're not completely done yet, since we need to add Composer system wide vendor bin directory in our path. It might be something you've never done, so let's do it together. The path is a system level variable that holds a list of directories. You can check it out by echoing out your dollar path, so your variable path. Hit enter, and this will show a path that you don't need to know out of your head, and mine path will probably look different than yours as well, and we're not going to use it again. We're just going to add our composer right here, and then we're done. 
This path is coming from the bash rc file from the root of our operating system. If you are located in a different location inside the CLI than your root, you simply need to perform a cd to change directories to the root. Once you see the tilde right here, you know that you've reached your project root. Now if we perform an ls right here to show all files that we have, you will not see a bash rc file. That's happening because a bash rc file is a hidden file, which starts with a punctuation mark. Therefore, we need to perform the ls command again, but we need to add a flag to it of space dash a to list all files. It's alphabetically, so let's scroll up to the b section, and right here you will see a bash rc file. What we need to do is to enter this file, which can be done through nano. So let's say nano space dot bash rc. Based on the programming language that you have used, you will find maybe none, one or multiple exports right here. What we need to do is creating a new one to export our composer file. So let's go right below the last export we had and let's create a new export called pad is equal to double quotes. Inside the double quotes, we're going to add a dollar sign home forward slash dot composer forward slash vendor forward slash bin colon dollar sign pad. We need to save and exit this file, which can simply be done by pressing down the control X button. That's asking us if we want to save it. So let's press Y and let's hit enter. Now that was everything we need. We will be setting up Visual Studio Code in the next episode, but after that, we will be starting off building our first Symfony project through Composer. Once you want to work with a framework such as Symfony, you need to make sure that you set up your code editor in the right way. In this tutorial, we're going to use Visual Studio Code since it's free, it's super easy to add extensions to, and it makes your experience a lot better. I'm on a Mac right now, and I won't be creating a video on how you can set up Visual Studio Code on Windows or Linux, because honestly, it's the exact same software system, but the buttons might be at another place. At the moment, I'm on code.visualstudio.com, which is the official website of Visual Studio Code, which I will link in the description down below. And you'll see that I have a call to action button right here, where I can download Visual Studio Code for Mac. This button will change based on the operating system you're using. If you have Windows, it will probably say something along the lines of download it for Windows. Once you click on download, make sure that you install it and I'll see you back once it's done. Alright, as you can see right now, I've got Visual Studio Code open and the interface looks pretty straightforward. But there's always a but, my colors are probably different than yours. That can be changed with something which is called an extension. With an extension, you can simply add stuff like languages, debuggers and tools that will support your development flow. So first things first, let's install an extension that will change the interface of our code editor. When you want to install an extension, you need to access the extensions market, which can be done through the sidebar right here, where you need to click on the four squares. Right here, you will probably see some extensions that I have installed that you don't have. Which is alright, because I've deleted all my Symfony and PHP related extensions, so we can download them together. Now the first extension that we're going to install is called Community. Material Team. Community Material Team, which is the first one, is an extension that allows you to change the colors of your interface. Let me make my panel a little bit smaller. All right. Now I've already got it installed, so let me actually uninstall it. All right. It changed the interface. Click on Install. And the drop down menu has appeared right now with some themes that you can choose from. I personally like to work with the Community Material Team Darker High Contrast because it doesn't hurt my eyes that much. Which is the same that I had before. I want to start up with PHP extensions because Symfony is obviously based on PHP. So we need to make sure that we got our PHP extensions set up correctly. I'm also going to open a Symfony test project. So once we install an extension, I can show you what the extension allows you to do. So let me do that. Let's open a folder. It's on my desktop, workspace, and it's a Symfony course name. Now the second extension that we're going to install is called PHP IntelliSense. It's the second one which is created by Ben Milburn. So let's click on install. This extension boosts your productivity because it does code completion, parameter help, find references, simple searchers, and way more. As you can see, it has been installed. So let me navigate to the explorer. 
and I've got a data movies controller file. So let me open it. You probably don't have it. So don't worry about it. Now let's scroll down to right below our public function index. And what we can do right now is to write down PUB. And you can already see that it recognizes what we want to write down, which is public. So it gives us an opportunity to auto complete the text. Let's hit enter. And as you can see, public has been printed out. Now let me remove it, save it, open the extensions market. Now the next extension is called PHP doc space comment. It's the first one created by Rex Xi. Let's install it. In coding and specifically in Symfony, you'll be needing to add PHP doc blocks. This extension allows you to automatically create it for a function, variable, or a class. So let me navigate back to the code and let's open the movies controller again and scroll up. And right here, we have a public function index. Now let's select it, including, whoops, the route. And what we can do next is to right click on it and we can add PHP doc blocks, but it also has a shortcut, which is way easier. So let's escape it, press the shift button, command button with the I. If you're not familiar with PHP docs, this might look like a comment section, but it's a bit different when it comes to Symfony because we've just added PHP doc blocks, which you'll get to understand better later on. But you can define things right here that are related to your controller, even routes. All right, now let's open the extensions market again and let's add the next one, which is called PHP namespace resolver. Honestly, this is a pretty cool one because it allows us to resolve namespaces and add them inside the use statement of our file. It's the first one created by Mehdi Hassan. So let's install it. Let's open our movies controller again. And if we scroll up, you'll see that we have a couple use statements right here. What we're doing right here is basically pulling in the response class, the route class and the abstract controller. These are all being used inside the class that we have as well. As you can see, movies controller is extending the abstract controller, which is coming from this line of code. Now let's delete the abstract controller use statement and it's throwing us an error right here. So what we can do is to remove it and write down abstract controller and right here, you can see that we can pull it in and it's also pulling in the use statement. So let's click on it. And as you can see, the use statement of our abstract controller is back. Now, Symfony is a framework that uses HTML, but inside a template engine called Twig. So let's focus on some extensions that we can use for our front end components. The first one is a simple one, which you probably have installed called HTML snippets. This extension allows you to add full HTML snippets. It's the first one created by Mohammed Abu Said. Let's install it. I'm not going to show this one because it kind of speaks for itself because you can make HTML snippets. Now let's do the same thing for our JavaScript. So let's search for JavaScript. It's the first one created by Charalampos Karipidis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Now, just like the HTML snippets, it allows you to add code snippets for JavaScript and ES6 syntax. When working with the Twig templating engine, we need to make sure that we add the extension called Symfony code snippets. Now let's scroll down because I can't see it. All right, it's this one created by Nadim al Abdoui. Let's install it. And what this extension allows us to do is to use more than 100 Symfony code snippets. And as you can see, it also supports Twig. Now let me show it to you. Let me go back to my code and I have a template folder where I store views right here. Let's open the base.html.twig. And don't worry, we will be learning all these weird file names later on. I just want to show you what it does, so just bear with me. If we then go, let's say inside our body, write down block and hit tab, you'll see that a twig block has been created for us, which is incredible because this is so much work to write yourself. Now let me undo it, save it and close off the file. And let's open the extensions market again. Now there's a pretty fun extension called Symfony for VS code. Now it's the first extension and I completely forgot to uninstall it, but this extension helps you to develop your project much faster because it provides auto completion of your Symfony container. Now I can't really test this out right now. So let's search for another one, which is called Twig. 
It's the first one. It has been created by what we do. And as you can see in the left panel, let's actually install it. You'll see that we have a lot more Twig options in the market. So let's also install Twig Language 2 and this one, which is Twig Language. These extensions help you with syntax highlighting, snippets, emit, formatting, hovering, and IntelliSense. Next to all these PHP and Symfony extensions, there are some helpers for Visual Studio Code. So let's install these as well. The one I personally love is called VS Code. Create icons. It's created by Emmanuel Biziat. And what this extension will do is adding an icon of the file extension right in front of your file name. This is super handy because it allows you to see what type of file you're working with. Right now, it also has it, but I just don't like these icons. So let's install it. Let's enable it. And as you can see, we have just added new icons and even for our folders. The next extension is called bracket pair colorizer. Since we're going to work with a lot of brackets of classes, methods, conditional statements, and loops, we got to make sure that we match brackets with a specific color. And that's what bracket pair colorizer created by Kunrad does. So let's install it. And let's add another one as well, which is called Emmet Live. Now Emmet is installed by default in Visual Studio Code. But Emmet Live expands your Emmet abbreviation dynamically while you're typing, which is pretty cool. So let's install this one created by Yuri Semanyuk. And that's it. I think that these extensions are must-haves in Visual Studio Code. We will definitely run into situations where we need to add another one here and there, but this is a very good starting point when working with Symfony. Symfony has four different ways on how you could create a project. I won't be covering them all because most of the time you'll be sticking to one or two ways. And in my opinion, using the Symfony installer or the Composer installer are the way to go. Before we can make use of the Symfony installer, we need to create a binary. Currently, I'm on Symfony's official website, which is symfony.com. And in the right corner, you'll see a download button. Let's click on it. Right there, you'll find an in-depth description on how you can install it on Mac, Linux, or Windows. If you're a Windows user, pause the video, download the setup.exe, and I'll see you back in a bit. If you're a Mac user like I am, let's click on Mac OS, copy the curl that we have right here, navigate to the CLI, so our terminal, and paste it right here. As the URL implies, we're going to get Symfony, and we're going to install Symfony CLI, which allows us to install Symfony projects through the CLI. So let's hit enter. Right now, you can see that Symfony CLI version 4.26.9 was installed, but it's asking us to configure Symfony on our local system. Now, as you can see, there are three different ways on how you could do that. Personally, I prefer to add the export inside my bash RC file. So what we can do is to basically copy this line of code that we have. Then we need to say, well, nano.bashrc, go to the bottom and paste it right here. Press Control X and save it to press Y, hit enter, and we're finally ready to create our first project. As you can see, I have a folder on my desktop called Workspace, and this is basically the location where I store coding projects. I also want to save my Symfony project right there. So what we need to do is to change up our directory inside our terminal to my Workspace. Now it's pretty simple to do that. We need to write down CD to change directories to our desktop first, followed by our Workspace. Hit enter, and as you can see, we're inside my Workspace right now. With the Symfony CLI tool that we just download, we should be able to create a new project. To do that, we simply need to perform Symfony, space, followed with the keyword new, space, followed with the project name. For now, let's call this project Movies. Before we hit enter and create our first project, I want to let you know that you can adjust your Symfony project's version number. By default, it will always grab the most up-to-date project's version, which will be 6 at this point. If you want to define, let's say, a Symfony 4 project, I don't understand why, but sometimes you do, you need to add a flag to your command. So yeah, a flag, that's something new. How do we define that? Well, that can be done by adding a space, double dash, version, and we need to set it equal to something. 
In our case, we want to set it equal to version 4.0. We're not going to hit enter because I want the most up-to-date version. So let's remove our flag and let's hit enter. Now, as you can see, our project is ready inside the workspace folder where it has created a folder called movies. Now let's CD into movies to double check it. All right, we're in movies, so the folder exists. Let's write down an LS and we got our first symphony project. We did not only install Composer to pull in packages, but it also gave us the opportunity to create a symphony project through the CLI. So what we can do is to go back one directory into our workspace folder by saying CD dot dot. Inside our workspace folder, we need to remove our movies folder and create a new project through Composer. So what we can do is to say rm, so remove, space, dash rf. The r stands for recursive removal and the f stands for force. So we're going to force a remove of the folder called movies. Let's hit enter. All right. To create a project through Composer, we need to write down Composer, space, create, dash, project. We're going to make a symphony project forward slash skeleton. We're not done yet because we do need to define the project name. So in our case, it will be movies again. Now, if we hit enter, it's going to install our new project, but this might take a second before it's done. Now let's change directories back into our movies folder. Be aware that if you want to do anything with your project, think about pulling in packages or starting it on your local host, you do need to be inside the project directory. So you can't run a command that has something to do with your project inside another folder. Like I've mentioned in the previous video, we need PHP 8 or higher installed on our local machine in order to run a Symfony 6 project in the browser. If you're not sure if your local machine is ready to run a Symfony project, you can always do a check by saying Symfony space check colon requirements. That's it, enter. Now, if you indeed have set up your environment in the right way, you can see that you're getting back a message where your system is saying that it's ready to run your Symfony projects. This will look at the version inside your composer file in the root of our project and compare it to the version you got on your local machine. Now, there is a command where you can check what the version number of your Symfony project is. That's by saying bin forward slash console space double dash version. And as you can see, we have set up a Symfony 6.0.0 project. I think that we're ready to run our project in the browser. Symfony CLI comes with a cool web server that is very easy to use. For this, you once again need to be located inside your project directory called movies and perform the Symfony space server colon start command. And let's also add a flag of dash D. What this flag will do is starting the web server in the background. Let's hit enter. It's giving us a warning, which is all right. But the most important thing is this right here. It has returned a green box, which says that our web server is listening right here, and it can be accessed through our local host right here. If you somehow have a web server running on your local host and you're getting an error, make sure that you run the symphony, that's a typo, server colon stop command before you perform this command. The 127.0.0.1 is the standard IPv address for your project that you need to run on your local host. The colon 8000 is in a random number, but it's the first available port that you have. You can copy this link and paste it in the browser, or if you're a lazy person as I am, there's a command that can do that for you, which is called symphony open colon local. All right, it has opened my project in a different browser. So let me close it off and go to Grave. And as you can see right here, our project is up and running. Now what I want to do right now is to go over the project structure that we have. So let me navigate back to Visual Studio Code. All right, we have pulled in our Symfony project, but there aren't that many files or folders inside the root of our project. Well, that happened because it uses the project skeleton that we pulled in which won't bring tons of dependencies with it, but only the Symfony components that are needed to run your project. At the top of our project directory, we've got the bin directory. This folder has only one file and it contains the main CLI entry point, which is the console. Below our bin, we have a convict folder, 
which we honestly won't be using that much since there are some default and sensible configurations right here. There is a public folder, which is the root of our directory. You'll find one file right here, which is the index.php file. And this file will be the main entry point for all dynamic HTTP resources. The most important directory is the source folder right here, the SRC. Pretty much all code that you'll be writing will be stored right here. If we open the kernel.php file, you'll see that it has a namespace called app, and this will be the same for all classes inside the source directory. This is the heart of your application where all the logic happens. Then we have the var folder right here, and you'll basically see what this directory is all about. It contains all cache and all log files that are generated at runtime by the application. Finally, we have the vendor folder, which is a pretty important folder since all packages that are installed through Composer and Symfony itself will be located right here. A tip for you is to never touch this directory. The main reason is that whenever you want to update those packages, you'll be running into conflicts. The best way to work with the vendor directory is to simply extend or overwrite functions, but we will get there later on. In the MVC pattern, controllers play a huge role since they are basically classes that organize the logic of one or more routes together in one place. You shouldn't see your controller as a place where you put all your application's logic. But it's better to think of controllers as a traffic cops that route HTTP requests around your application. In order to create your controller in Symfony, you need to define your configuration format first. In Symfony, there are four options and one is actually quite old. You've got YAML, XML, PHP, and the old one, which are the annotations. Any of these options is a good option, don't get me wrong. In my opinion, you should choose one where you're the most comfortable with. If I could give my honest opinion, YAML is a bit difficult to read and annotation simplifies the process, but that's because I'm used to it. Annotations also allows you to do the configuration directly inside the controller. So we need to pull it in through the CLI. And I don't want to use an external CLI right now because I don't want to keep switching screens. So what we can do is to open the integrated terminal in Visual Studio Code. Inside the top menu, let's click on terminal and let's click on new terminal. All right, inside the terminal, let's run composer, require annotations. This command will pull in everything we need in order to use annotations. Now it has been done. So it's time to create our controller. Instead of creating the file ourselves, we can use the CLI in order to make our first controller. So what we can do inside the CLI is basically saying symphony, console, space. Then we got to say what we want to do. So we want to make something, colon, a controller, space, followed with the controller name. Let's say movies, controller. Now we're also adding the word controller right here, which is quite important to have. Now remember, the name that we're adding right here, so movies controller, will also be the name of our file, but also the class name. So don't forget to use Pascal case right here. Developers on the internet have been arguing for many years if controllers should be singular or plural. And honestly, just choose something you're comfortable with. I'm comfortable with using plural, but if you think it should be singular, Go ahead and call it movie controller. The logic will work in the same exact way. Now, once we perform this command, you will see that we finally got our first error message. Now, if I make my terminal a little bit bigger, you'll see that the error is saying that the make command has not been defined. Now we can double check that. We can see which commands are available in Symfony by performing the Symfony console command. Right here, you'll see an entire list of commands and flags that we can perform. And I'm not going to cover all of them because there are quite a lot, but what I do want to test is the help command right here. So let's hit the arrow up to get our last console command and let's add a space help. As you could see, there is a list of options that we could add right here, but there's one help command that we can perform, which is the bin console help list right here. I'm not going too in depth on it, otherwise we'll lose track of the actual video which we already did because we were talking about controllers. With Composer, we need to make sure that we pull in maker in order to make commands. So let's do that. Let's say composer require doctrine space maker. 
Now, as you could see, we just run into an error message. Now, there is a package that needs to be installed in Symfony 8 that has not been updated with the PHP version that it needs to use. Now, I found a workaround. Now, what we can do is to open the composer.json and let's make it a little bit smaller. And right inside our require section, let's require a package. Let's name it laminas forward slash laminas dash code colon tilde 4.5.0 at dev. And don't forget to end it up with a semicolon. Now, what we can do is to save it. And inside the terminal, we can say composer install to update our composer.log. All right, that has been fixed. And what we can do right now is to say composer require maker. And what this will do is install the maker package. As you can see, it has been fixed. So let's create our controller one more time. Let's say symphony console make colon controller called movies controller. If we hit enter, you can see that a new file has been created inside the source folder where there is a folder called controllers with a file name of moviescontroller.php. And down below, you'll see a green box with a success message inside of it. Now let's open it. Let's open our source folder and let me make the terminal a little bit smaller controller folder and our movies controller. You'll see a file structure right here that you will see a lot in Symfony files. Now it always starts off with a PHP opening tag followed with a namespace app backslash controller. Now by default, it has pulled in three use statements right here. These are and should always be defined at the top of our page below the namespace because they allow you to use these classes however you want. Now below our use statements, we got the place where the real magic happens. We got a class right here called movies controller, which has and needs to be the same name as the file. It also extends the abstract controller that I just mentioned inside the use statement right here as the first use statement. And before we continue on, let me actually show you why use statements should be placed at the top of our page. If we copy our statement of the abstract controller and remove it and paste it at the bottom of our page, save it, you will see that the abstract controller is getting an error right now because the abstract controller does not exist inside the use statement. Now the reason why is because we're defining it right after we're using it, which cannot be done. So let me undo everything. Then we're going inside our class, well, this line of code, and this might be something that's new for you if you haven't used frameworks before, and in particular, a Symfony framework. What we're doing right here is called a route as an attribute that defines the route for a particular method. It's called a route method, saying that whenever the forward slash movies endpoint is being hit, the index method right here will be returned to the browser. Now let's test it out. Let's see if we're getting this JSON object back inside of the browser. Let's navigate to the browser. Let's change the endpoint to forward slash movies. Our JSON response, which was automatically added inside the controller class, has been printed out right here. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code and change our endpoint to, let's say, forward slash movie, save it and navigate back to the browser, let's refresh it, you'll see that the endpoint does not exist, so it has not been found. Because we obviously just said, well, change the route of the public function index method to forward slash movie. If we navigate back to Brave and change our endpoint to movie, you will see the same JSON object that has been printed out. If you're using an older PHP version or maybe even a better one in the future, your annotations or attributes might look different than mine. Now this is a pretty new method when you want to define your route. Let me show you the old way, just in case you're on the internet searching for issues that are not related to annotations on routes. So what we can do is to go right below our public function index and create a new method called public function, let's say old method. We're going to add a colon right after the parentheses and we're going to say that this method needs to return a response. Right now we can add our curly brace. All right. And this is actually a new method since PHP 7.1, and it's called a return type declaration. Our response will throw an error right now because we haven't defined a response. 
Now we have added an extension in Visual Studio Code that will create doc blocks for us. So let's do that. Let's select our method, press Shift Command I, and this will create a new block above our code, as you can see right here, which in your eyes might look like a comment, but it's actually the annotations method. At the moment, it's returning a response. But what we can do is defining our route right here. So let's remove the return response. And let's say at route parentheses. Now the route method accepts two parameters. The first one is actually the endpoint and the second one is the name. So let's say double quotes. Inside the double quotes, let's say old. So let's go right outside of it and add a comma, space, name. Let's set it equal to a value of a string and let's name it old. Now what we can do next is to copy this return this JSON object that we have inside our index method and paste it right inside the movies controller. Instead of saying, well, the message is welcome to our new controller, let's rename it to old method. Now let's save it. Let's navigate back to the browser. Let's change our endpoint to forward slash old. And as you can see, our response has been printed out with the response of old method. The old annotation method still works fine, but in my opinion, we should just stick with a new method rather than the old one. So let's get rid of the piece of code that we created. So right here, let's remove this entire piece of code. All right. Now, what is the logic behind all of this? Well, that can be found inside the Convic folder where you have a routes folder followed with an annotations.yaml file. This file isn't actually an annotations file, but the right word is actually a bundle. What this file will do is creating a route from the controller folder right here, based on our annotation. When developing websites in Symfony, you usually stumble on routes with parameters. At the moment, we got a basic route defined in our movies controller right here of forward slash movie, which actually needs to be changed to movies. The idea behind this route is that it will basically get all movies that are available in your database or movies that you have to find inside your controllers. But what if you want to show one particular movie? So let's say that you only want to show data of forward slash movies forward slash inception. If we got one movie to find, we could easily add a forward slash inception like we did right now. This works fine, but you do need to do this for every single movie that you got. And believe me, that will be quite a lot of work. Therefore, a route parameter comes into play. It's basically a route that has a parameter in the URL structure and that is a variable. So the value will change based on the name of the movie you have inside your URL. Now, when you want to use route parameters, you obviously need to remove inception inside your route and you need to wrap your variable inside a set of curly braces. Now, be aware that we're not going to pass in the name of one specific movie but a variable that represents a specific movie. This could be an ID, it could be a slug, or maybe you prefer to show the name inside the URL. So let's remove slug and add name. And passing in the name or an ID is actually pretty common. So let's keep it at name for now. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, change our endpoint to forward slash movies, forward slash inception, you'll see that we're getting the JSON response that we have defined inside our index method right here. Now there is a command in Symfony which shows you all routes that are available in your project. So inside the terminal, let's perform the Symfony console debug colon router command. If we hit enter and let me scroll up, you can see on the first line that we have a preview error, which is something we don't need to worry about, but the route down below, is the movies endpoint, which has a name of movie, the method is any, scheme is any, host is any, but the path is forward slash movies, forward slash a variable called name. Now if we navigate back to Brave and change the endpoint to let's say Avengers, you'll see that the same message is being printed out. Now there is something that we haven't added, but I do need to mention it, but keep in mind that it's optional, and that's a method parameter inside the route. At the moment, you'll see that our method has been defined to any, which is actually not something that's right. What we can do is to go right after our name inside our route, add a comma, space, 
define a new parameter which is called methods colon and then we're going to pass in an array so a set of brackets now the methods that we want to perform right here is the in single quotes get method comma the hat method now the get method makes sense because we're going to get a value from the url if we save it and run the command one more time inside the terminal you can see that we have changed our method from the movie's endpoint to get pipe hat, which is the correct format. It's pretty cool what we've done so far, but you usually want to do something with the parameter that is being passed in. Right now, we're just checking the right endpoint. If you want to use it inside your code, which you usually will do because based on the name, you can grab more information from the database, you need to pass in the parameter inside the index method, right inside of the parentheses. Keep the name equal to the parameter that you have in the route. So let's say dollar sign name. What we can do right now is to change our message value. So the key is message and the value is not a string anymore, but our name. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh it. And as you could see, Avengers has been printed out. Now let's test it out with inception. So let's say forward slash inception and right here inception has been printed out you can also make your route parameter optional by including a default parameter inside your route so let's navigate back to visual studio code now let's go right after our name add a comma space create a new parameter called defaults colon and we're going to set it equal to an array right here inside the array we're going to pass in a key value pair now the key will be name in our case the value will be null. The default value of name is null, so there is no name. Otherwise, it will be a value you pass in as a parameter. If we save it and navigate back to Brave, refresh it, you see that Inception has been printed out. Now let's remove Inception, and right here, you'll see that the endpoint is null. Now let me show you what will happen if we remove our defaults. Save it, navigate back to Brave, refresh it, we got an error because our forward slash movies does not exist. And if we add a parameter of inception, as you can see, this still works fine. So it's actually pretty nice that you have the option to define a default route parameter. Now that we went over the basics of controllers, it's time to focus on views in Symfony. A view basically represents the template that will be shown to the end user on the screen. Symfony offers a custom templating engine called Twig. Compared to views in PHP, Twig has its own syntax, learning curve, and a powerful and intuitive model. There is an interaction between views and controllers because views will be shown based on a method in the controller. At the moment, we're returning a JSON, and it's finally time to get rid of it and return a user interface. So let's delete our entire return statement and let's also clean up our code a little bit since we're not going to pass in a parameter anymore. All right. We also don't need the defaults. So let's delete that as well. And we don't need the method. All right. If you want to show a view to the end user, you need to return the render method, which can be done by returning this render. Right now, you'll see that there is no error on response anymore because we're actually returning something, but there's a new error under the render method. This is happening because we need to return the path of our Twig template. Twig has not been automatically added, so we need to pull it in through Composer. Inside the CLI, let's say Composer, require, Twig. Let's hit enter. What this command have done is creating a templates folder inside the root of our application, where you can find a base.html.twig file. This is the location where you need to store your views. Now we're not going to focus on the base.html.twig file because that's something for the next video. But for now, let's create a new file right here. Let's call it index.html.twig. What we can do right here is basically define HTML tags. So let's write down div. You can see that it's actually not working since our extension is the other way around. Usually .html is the file extension. But at the moment, the ending file extension is .twig. Emmet works based on the file extension. So Visual Studio Code does not know what to do since it's not ending with .html. 
Now I have a workaround for it, because we can tell Visual Studio Code that Twig templates needs to be handled like .html files. Inside the top menu, let's click on Code, Preferences and Settings. Now let's search for Settings right here. Now right here, you can see an option where you can edit in settings.json. So let's do that. What we need to do right here is defining a new line of code. So just follow along. It doesn't really matter where. So let's say right here. Let's add double quotes. Let's say Emmet dot include languages. After our double quotes, we're going to add a colon, space, set of records. And what we're going to say is that in double quotes, twig needs to be handled as HTML files. Now we still have an error right here because we need to close it off with a comma. If we save it and navigate back to our index.html file, remove the div, write down div again, hit tab, you'll see that it works right now and we're ready to continue on with this video. What we can do is to remove our div, write down h1 and hit tab. And inside our h1, let's just print out a text of welcome to this symphony course. Save it. Now we do need to define the view inside the controller. So let's open our movies controller and right inside of the render method, add single quotes and define the path of our view. Now by default, the render method knows that it needs to look inside the templates folder. So what we need to do is to say, well, find me the index.html.twig file. Now we're almost done because we still have our parameter. Let's delete it. Let's navigate back to Brave. Refresh the page, and as you can see, Welcome to the Symphony course has been printed out. Now the render method inside the controller accepts another parameter which is optional. What you eventually want to do is to get values from your database inside the controller and pass it through to the view. Now to do this, we need to add a comma right after our first parameter, so the index.html.twig, and then we're going to add a set of brackets right here since we're going to pass in an array straight to the view. In here, we're going to pass in an index value pair. Now the index will be in single quotes title and the value will be Avengers end game. Now it won't be visible in the view right now because we're not doing anything with it. So what we can do is to open our index.html.twig. Let's remove our welcome to the symphony course and we need to somehow echo out data inside our twig. Now in plain PHP, you would probably do something like this. Variable name and close it off. Now in Twig, it's a little bit different. Let's delete it. And whenever you want to print out variables, you need to wrap it around a double set of curly braces. Then inside the curly braces, you can just write down the index name that you passed in. With PHP, you have to put a dollar sign in front of it to tell the application that it's a variable. But Symfony does understand that we're dealing with a variable. So what we can do is to say, well, we have a title right here. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to Brave. Refresh it. And as you can see, Avengers Endgame has been printed out. Another cool thing that I have to mention is that you can add a dump inside a Twig template, which is a method. So what we can do is to delete title, write down dump, parentheses, because it's a method. Then inside the method, we can print out the title. Save it, navigate back to Brave. And as you can see, the dump method is a function that will provide a bit more information about the template variable. And we will be using this quite a lot to debug our template. As you can see, it's a string with 17 characters with a value of Avengers Endgame. Now let's focus on conditional statement inside a Twig template for a moment. A conditional statement is basically an if, else, and else if statement. It's comparable to the statement of PHP, but you write it a little bit different. Let's remove this piece of code that we have and also our h1. Whenever you want to execute a block of code, you need to put it in between an opening curly brace, followed with a percentage sign. Now the same thing needs to happen when you want to close it. So space, percentage sign. Inside this block, we can basically define the if statement. Now the if statement has an expression, which in our case will be title. So we're basically going to see if title has been set or not. Now right below our if statement, we could simply do anything we want if the condition is true. So what I want is to hit a tab, create a paragraph and say title 
is a movie. Now this will only print out a block if the title has been set. So let's also create a paragraph if the title is empty. This can be done in the same exact way, but in an else statement. So let's go on the line below. Let's add curly braces, percentage sign, space, else, and let's close it off as well. What we're going to print out is a new paragraph with whoops, no title has been set. Now keep in mind that this won't work. If we save it and navigate to Brave, refresh it, you'll see that we're getting an unexpected end of template. That's happening because you need to close off your if statement. Right after our else statement, we're kind of done, right? So we need to add another block. So right here, let's say another block. Then right here, we need to define the end if statement. Save it, navigate to Brave, refresh it, and right here. Avengers Endgame is a movie has been printed out because our title has been set. Now let's open our movies controller. Let's remove the value of Avengers Endgame, save it, navigate back to Brave, refresh it, and as you can see, whoops, no title has been set, has been printed out, because our title is empty. Usually when you create websites using PHP, Symfony, or any other framework, you want to reuse components on a website. Especially when it comes to layouts. You don't want to redefine your style sheet, JavaScript files, font awesomes, and all those other utilities that you're pulling in on every single page. I've told you that by default, Twig has a base.html.twig file, and we got the index file that we created ourselves. Think about it. Do you want to define your head tags for every single page? In most cases, you don't want to do that. What you should be doing is passing in the base.html.twig file as your layout, and add the actual content inside the index file. Now in our base file, you'll see some new elements that we haven't talked about before. So let's go over them one by one. We obviously have our plain HTML template. So our doc type, HTML, head, meta, title, and link. And I kind of expect you guys to understand the meaning behind all of these tags. But if we look at the title, for instance, you'll see something inside of it where we haven't used that much. We've got our opening title tag and our closing title tag, but we have a curly brace right here, followed with a percentage sign, the keyword block, and a block is basically a place or location where a child's template can extend their content. In this specific case, the title tag is defined inside our head, but if we extend the base file inside the index file, you don't need to define the title tag that we have right here, but you can simply change up the block right here. Next to the keyword block, you'll see a name that changes for every single block. We got the title right here, we have a style sheet, JavaScript, and we have a body block. Right now, the block of our title that we have is called title. If we use this title block inside our index file, the value will replace welcome with an explanation mark. If you want to extend this piece of block, you need to call this specific block inside the index page without the title tag. The main content of the index page will be replaced with the body block that we have right here. Then we need to add data that you want to have on your index page in between the opening and closing block. So let's start off by extending the base file inside the index file. So let's remove everything that we have. We don't need it anymore. And let's create a construct since we're going to run some logic. What we're going to do is to create a new extents. So let's write down extents and hit enter. It has pulled in an extent, so a open and curly brace, percentage sign. It's telling us that it needs to extend something. And what it needs to extend is a template. Now we can remove the keyword template that we have in here. And what we need to say is what we want to extend. In our case, it is the base.html.twig file. Behind the scenes, we have pulled in this entire file in our index file, but you won't see it. So what we can do right now is overwrite the block title. So let's do that. So we can create a block by ourselves by saying curly brace percentage sign and adding the keyword block of title. But this is quite a lot of work. So let's just use a shortcut. Let's write down block and hit enter. And as you can see, it has created a opening and closing block for us. We do need to change up the name to title. Now the value needs to be placed in between the opening and closing block. So let's say movies page. Before we test this out in the browser, 
Let's do it one more time for the actual content, which like I said, is located inside the body block. So let's create a new block. Let's give it a name of body and we need to add content in here. So let's say that we want to create a new H1 and inside our H1, we have a value of title that's coming from our controller right here. If we save it and navigate to the browser, refresh the page, you will see that the Avengers Endgame has been printed out, which is coming from our controller. The most important thing right here isn't the fact that Avengers has been printed out, but if we inspect the page and open our head tag, you'll see that our title tag has a value of movies page, which we have added inside our index file right here, which is overriding the welcome explanation mark block. So what we can do is to open our index page again and let's remove the entire block, save it, navigate back to Brave, refresh the page, and as you could see, welcome has been printed out right now from the base file. All right, now let's work with some more data from the controller. I went over some IMDb movies, so let's add them inside an array in our movies controller. Right above our return statement, let's create a new array called movies and let's set it equal to a set of brackets. Inside our movies array, we're going to define a value of Avengers Endgame. I need more because I obviously have an array. So the second one is Inception. Then we have Loki and we finally have Black Widow. We do need to change up our return value. So let's remove the entire array that we have. And after the comma of our view, we're going to define an array method. And let's go inside the parentheses and hit enter. And what we're going to do right here is passing in a key value pair. The key in single quotes will be called movies and the value will be our variable movies that we have up here. If we save it and open our index.html.twig file, we should be able to do something with the movies we just passed in. So inside our block, let's remove the title that we have with variable movies. If we save it and navigate to the browser, let me close off the console, refresh the page, we got an exception and it's basically telling us what we're trying to do. We're trying to print out an array as a string. When working with arrays inside an interface, you do need to loop over your array values before you can print them out. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's remove the entire H1 tag. So we need to create a for loop. So let's write down for and hit tab. All right, the syntax has been created, but it is a little bit different than in PHP. In PHP, you use their loop the other way around. You're usually going to loop over an array as one single item. In Twig, you're going to loop over one specific item inside an array. So we're going to loop over a movie in the array movies. What we want to do next is to go inside our for loop, create a list item. And well, we're basically going to say curly braces and print out one specific movie. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will indeed see that all the movies have been printed out as a list item. Now, if we navigate back to the code editor, I need to show you one more syntax and that is used for comments. Sometimes you just want to comment something out and use it later on. What you can do is replacing the second curly brace with a hashtag and the first one from the closing curly brace. As you can see, the color has been changed to a darker gray. And if we save it and navigate back to Brave, refresh it, you will only see list items without the actual value. Before I wrap up the video, there are a couple more variables that I want to show you. And these are called global variables, which are available throughout all views without passing them through the controller. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's remove our entire for block. And inside our body block, we're basically going to say, well, we're going to print out a variable. So we need our curly brace underscore self. Save it, navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh it. And right there, you'll see that the current page name has been printed out, which obviously is index.html.twig. The second global variable is called underscore char set. Save it, navigate back to the browser, refresh it. And right here, you'll see that the current char set is obviously UTF-8. The last one is actually something that you might be using quite a lot when programming in Symfony. Sometimes you want to define a variable and use it throughout your entire application. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code 
Now let's scroll up. Inside our config folder, we have a packages folder. Let's open it. And in here, we have a twig.yaml file. We can define global variables right below our default underscore path that we have right here. We can define a new section, so let's do it, called globals. We do need to add a colon because we want to set it equal to a value. Then on the line below, we can define a new section for globals. And this kind of looks like key value pair. Now the key will be, let's say, author, colon, and the value will be code with diary. If we save it and navigate back to our index.html.twig file, we can simply replace the underscore char set with author. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will see that code with Dari has been printed out. If you are interested to join, the link will be in the description down below. Up until this point, we only worked with static content, meaning that we created a variable inside the controller, passed it through the view, and printed it out. In the real world, you probably won't be working with static content. Symfony provides a suite of tools that you can use to interact with your application's database in order to pull in dynamic data. Since we're working with a framework and the main goal is to make our lives a lot easier, we will be using something which is called an object relational mapper, and the shortcut of it is ORM. And in particular, we'll be using Doctrine as our ORM, since it will treat PHP classes and objects like they are tables and records. This will prevent us from writing SQL queries for CRUD operations, and the ORM will do it for us. Before we can make use of our database, we need to make sure that we got MySQL up and running, because we need to have a database to interact with. In the beginning of this course, we've set up MySQL through the terminal, and based on the settings you provided, you should be knowing your username and password. There are multiple ways on how you could create a database. Personally, I find the Symfony console command the easiest method because it reads the database configuration and creates the database. So let's make the terminal a little bit bigger and let's perform the symphony console command. Right here, you will find an entire list of commands that you can perform. What we want to do is to do something with Doctrine because that's the ORM we're going to use for our database. So let's scroll up to the D section right here and you will find a complete list of commands that you can perform on Doctrine. There are a lot of commands right here, but for now, let's focus on the doctrine database create command that we have right here and the database drop command that we have. The name speaks for itself, right? You can create a new database through doctrine. You can delete a database or you can even import a SQL file. There is actually a shortcut command, so you don't need to scroll up to the doctrine section, which is symphony console list the doctrine commands. If we hit enter, scroll up, you will only see doctrine commands that are available in your application. So let's focus on creating a database first. Let's perform the symphony console doctrine colon database colon create command. Whoops, we're getting a couple error messages right here. So let's start off at the top. We got an opening and closing curly bracket right here with critical inside of it, which will tell us the level of error we got. This one is critical, so we can't do anything else. Now, what is the error? It's basically telling us that the connection has failed to connect to our local host with a port of 5432. This should make sense, because we haven't even set up our database credentials. It does not know where to look to store the MySQL database doctrine is trying to create for us. Luckily, there is a .env file in the root of our application. Before we add our credentials in the .env file, we need to pull in two packages through Composer. So let's do that first. The first one is called Composer require symphony forward slash ORM dash pack. Let's hit enter. And it's pulling everything in right now. And the second one will be Composer require double dash dev because we're going to pull the package in in development mode. The package has a name of symphony forward slash maker dash bundle. Let's hit enter. Now let's write down no, because we don't want to move our key. And let's say that we want to rerun the command with dev. So let's say yes. All right, that was pretty fast. Now the next step is to open our .env file in the root of our application. Now let me make my terminal a little bit smaller. 
In this file, you will find environment variables, and we don't have that many right now. We only have the app underscore env, the app secret, and the database URL, which is actually the one that we need. At the moment, it's telling us that it's using Postgres, but we don't want that. On the line above, you will find a command for MySQL. So let's copy it and let's replace it with the URL that we have as our environment value. If you are not familiar with these types of connection strings, you need to change up some things right here. The first value is db underscore user, which will be the user you're using in MySQL. In my case, it will be root. Then we got a colon followed with a db password, which will be the password of their user root. In my case, I've set my password equal to dari1234. Right after the at sign, you'll be seeing the local host, which is all right because that's what we're going to use. And our port is all right as well. After our port, we have a forward slash followed with the db underscore name, which we need to replace as well. Now we're going to create a database with the same name of our project, which will be movies. Then the last value that we can change is the server version right here, which has been set equal to 5.7, but we're not going to change that. All right, this should do the trick for us. If we navigate back to the CLI, hit the arrow up to create our database again. Let's hit enter. And as you could see, our CLI has returned a message that our database called movies has been created for a connection name of default. Let's double check it. Now I've got a database client extension added in Visual Studio Code called database. So let me click on it. Let me refresh all my databases that I have. And right at the bottom, you will see a new database created called movies. Up until this point, we only worked with static data. Symfony provides a suite of tools for interacting with your application's database. It uses an object relational mapper called Doctrine, like I mentioned in the previous video. Doctrine is probably one of the most influential features of Symfony because it makes, together with Eloquent or Laravel, a major difference of PHP frameworks. The main reason that Symfony uses Doctrine is because of its simplicity. Doctrine treats PHP classes and objects like they are tables and records. Therefore, we don't need to write SQL queries anymore for create, read, update, and delete actions. You will be hearing the term entity classes a lot when working with Symfony. And it's actually pretty simple to get a good understanding of an entity class. If we think about our basic PHP project, you've got the MVC layer, where the model layer will interact with the tables in your database. With Doctrine, it's a little bit different. The MVC part is still the same, but you don't call the tables inside your database tables anymore, but you will call entities. Since we've already set up our database in the previous video, we can create our first table, or better to say, our first entity. We're not going to do this manually inside an interface, but just like creating our database, Doctrine has a command for that. Inside the CLI, let's perform the symphony console list Doctrine command. Now let me make the terminal a little bit bigger. Now, even though we're going to do something with Doctrine, the entity command will not be visible right here. What we do need to do is to perform the symphony console command because we're going to make something. Now, what we're going to make starts with the letter E. So let's scroll up. And right here, we're going to make an entity which will create or update a Doctrine entity class and optionally an API platform resource. So let's perform it inside the CLI. Let's say symphony console, make me something, colon, entity. Now you could add the name of your entity as an optional argument, but if we hit enter right now, let me actually zoom in a little bit. All right, right here, you will see that it does recognize that we haven't added an entity name. So it's making sure that we do that before we can proceed. Entities are the same as models. So let's add a singular name of movie right here. If we hit enter, you will see that it has created two files for us. The first one is stored inside the source folder, entity folder with a file called movie.php, but it has also created a doctrine repository inside the source folder, repository folder called movie-repository.php. Let's focus on the entity class first before we continue on with the repository. It has also prompted us with another question because we need to add property names right here. Property names will basically be the column name in SQL. By default, Doctrine will automatically add the ID for every single entity. 
Now, what does a movie have? Well, probably something like a title, right? So let's write it down right here. Next up, we need to define the field type, or better to say the data type. Now, for our title, we're simply going to work with a string. Then we need to add the field length, so the amount of characters. Now let's keep it 255. Let's hit enter. And the next one is actually pretty important because it's asking us if it can be nullable or not. In our case, it can't, since it's the title of the movie and that's where the movie is all about. So you can't create a movie without a title. So can it be nullable? No, it cannot. Just like the field types, it's adding a value of no right here after the question, which is the default answer. So if you remove your no answer that you have added and hit enter, it will define no. I personally like to add it, so let's write down no and hit enter. Now it just told us that it has updated source entity movie.php file. And that was it actually. Those were the default questions for a property. Now it's also asking us if we want to add more properties. And yes, we actually do. What's the next one? Let's say something like release year. I prefer to add it in camel case rather than underscore and I'll show you later on why. Let's hit enter. Now the field type of our release year will be an integer and it cannot be nullable inside a database. So let's add a no. Now we're also going to add one more, which is the description. It has a field type of a string total of 255 characters, and a description can be nullable. So let's write down yes. Now the last one is our image path. So to save the image banner of our movie, the field type is a string because we're going to add the path of our image. Then the field type can be 255 again, and it cannot be nullable. All right, that was it for our entity. Now in order to exit it, we need to hit the control C button on our keyboard to interrupt it. Well, let me make everything smaller again. All right. Terminal as well. Now let me close off the database that I have right here. Like I've showed you a couple times before, the movie class has been stored inside the source folder, entity folder, where it has created a movie.php file. Let's open it. Right above our class, right here, you will see an annotation which will link the repository class. So right here, with a movie repository colon colon class. So what this annotation is doing is telling our ORM that the movie repository class is linked to the movie entity where we're in right now. Now the class makes sense, which is called movie. If we scroll down, you'll see some pretty straightforward things, right? We got a couple private properties. So ID, the title, the release year, and the description followed with the image path, excuse me. And every property has its own annotation, as you could see right here, which is basically metadata for Doctrine. It's simply saying that the type is a string with a length of 255 characters. Description has a nullable as well, which is true, which has been added here as well. What this allows Doctrine to do is mapping the classes to the right table. Now, if we scroll down, you'll see that every property has its own getters and setters as well, right here. We have the set title, get release here which should make sense as well, because it's a common thing in object-oriented PHP. There's one thing that sucks my mind. Since this is pure PHP and we don't see anything that's new to us, what is Doctrine syntax? Doctrine will come into play later on, and not right here. Now let's scroll up a little bit to the ID property that we have right here. And inside the annotations, you can see that ORM is calling a generated value class right here. What this will do is generating a unique ID for us. We could actually migrate her entity right now and create a table inside a movies table with the name of movie. But I want to take it a step further since this is actually pretty simple. A big advantage that ORMs have over basic databases is the fact that you can link entities. When linking entities, you can pretty much define relationships between tables. Let's think about one. We got our entity movie, but we haven't defined actors anywhere in our entity. So how would you do that? Would you add a column name with a name actor where you store an actor name every single time for a movie? Or would you prefer to work with a pivot table? Well, that's actually my recommendation. So let's define a new entity first. Let's make the terminal a little bit bigger. Inside the CLI, let's write down Symphony Console. Make me a new entity called actor. All right, let's hit enter. 
it created an entity and repository for our actor. Now, we're going to keep it simple by creating one property called name. The field type is a string. It has 255 characters and it cannot be nullable. Now let's press Ctrl C to exit our CLI. Now whenever you want to define a relationship between different tables, you have to define the first entity again. So let's say Symphony console make colon entity called movie. Let's hit enter. All right, it's telling us that the entity already exists and we can add a new property. So let's do that. What we want to do is to add a new actor. So let's write down actors right here, which will be the new property. Now let's take a minute and talk about the fact that I've added actors, so plural right here. There are multiple relationships available in Symfony and I will create a separate video where I talk about them. But what is the relationship between a movie and an actor? Well, one movie can have multiple actors, right? But one actor has also starred in multiple movies. So therefore, I recommend using plural right here. So let's hit enter. For the field type, we're not going to define a data type, so a string, integer, or whatever, but we need to define the relationship. In our case, we're talking about a many to many relationship. Let's hit enter. It's also asking us what the entity should be related to. Now, what we want to do is to use the actor class, which should be in Pascal case. Let's hit enter. Now, it's also asking us if we want to add a new property so you can access or update the movie object from the actor. So the other way around. Now, in our case, let's write down yes. Now, do we want to add a new field name inside our actor movie? Actually not. So let's press Ctrl and C to exit it. And as you can see inside our entity folder, it has created an actor.php file. So let's open it. Now our actor entity should have two properties, which is the private ID that has been added by default and the private name that we have created. But as you can see, it also has a third one, which is the private movies property. Inside the annotations, you will see that it has a many to many relationship defined. It has a target entity class of movie and it has been mapped by actors. We also have a constructor defined. Just a quick reminder, a constructor will be executed once the class is being called. So right here, it will set the movies property, so this movies, which will refer to the private movies above, to a new array collection. If we scroll a bit more down, you will see a couple methods that we haven't seen before. The first one is the get movies, which will get all movies from the actor entity. We have the public function add movie, which is accepting a movie object as a parameter. And then it says colon self. Self is probably something that you haven't seen before. And it basically refers to the current class. This class is trying to enforce that the returned instance is on the same class. Now what is going on inside of it? It's going to check if the movies array is not containing the movie. And if it doesn't, add the movie right here inside the movie array. Finally, it will also add the actor to the movie. Down below, you will find the remove movie method. And when we defined our entity, we said that whenever a movie gets deleted, the actor that is related should be deleted as well. This is a pretty clean way of keeping your database clean. Now that we have generated our first two entities, we should be able to see it inside the database, right? If we navigate back to my local database and refresh it, open the movies table, you actually don't see the new tables called movie and actor. That's happening because an entity needs to be migrated. Obviously, Doctrine is smart enough to understand that we need to migrate our entities, so it has installed it with the ORM dependency that we added in the previous episode. Now, this can be done inside the CLI, so let's make the CLI a little bit bigger and let me zoom in. What we can do is to say, well, Symphony console first, and once again, inside the make section, so let's scroll up, you'll find a command called make a migration. What this will do is creating a new migration based on database changes. So let's perform it. Let's say symphony console make colon migration. Let's hit enter. And as you could see, it has returned a success message. It has also created a new migration inside the migrations folder with a pretty difficult name attached to it. The version makes sense. But what are all these numbers right here? The first four are the year, as you can see right here, it's 2021. 
Then we got two numbers for the month, which is 12, and we got 0, 4 for the day. Then we have a couple other numbers, which are for the hours, minutes, and seconds attached to it. So let's open the file. Let's navigate back to our explorer. Let's open the migrations folder inside the root of our directory, and let's open the migration. Now let's scroll down to the up method. And one thing I really like right here is the fact that Doctrine understands that the movie and actor entity have both not been migrated. So it basically adds the entire entity right here in SQL language. When a system is being migrated, it will wrap the up method from all migrations available right here. Currently, we're working with one migration file. So if we run our migration, this specific file will be migrated. Now the migration system also allows you to roll back a migration. What this will do then is grabbing the down method right below of it, and it will undo whatever has been done inside the up method. So it basically alters the table and it will drop the Vorin key. It will drop the table actor, movie, and the pivot table, which is the movie actor table right here. Now we had another method right here at the top, which was the get description method. And this method is created for the nullable that we have set to yes. Now let's have a look at our migrations one more time. Let me actually zoom out. Now let me make this a little bit smaller. All right. Now you might wonder why we're going to perform five queries. This is number one, two, three, four, and five. We defined a relationship. So it first needs to create a table for the two entities. So it will create a table for the actor and it will create a table for the movie. Symphony also understands that we need a pivot table, which is the third one. So it will create a table for the movie actor. Right here, we will store the movie ID, which cannot be null, and the actor ID, which cannot be null as well. Now both IDs, so the actor ID and the movie ID, needs to come from somewhere, which will be done in the last two queries. First one will alter the table movie actor. It will add a foreign key of movie ID, and it will reference to ID on the table movie. And on delete, it will cascade it, meaning that it will delete the row once a movie has been deleted. The same thing needs to be done for the actor. It will tell us that the actor underscore ID is a foreign key. It will reference on the actor table where it needs to find the ID. A foreign key is basically the column in a relationship database table that provides a link between two variables. Now let me zoom in again. All right, now let me open the sidebar. Now inside the console, you'll see that Symfony is already telling us what we need to do next. Instead of running the PHP bin console command, I prefer to use the symphony console command. But the second part of the command will stay the same. So we can say doctrine, colon migrations, colon migrate. Keep in mind that it will create a table, which is singular. So actor, and we have movie right here. If you want to change it, change it up. I'll just keep it as it is. So let's run the command. It's prompting us with a warning right here which is awesome because you will overwrite the tables if you have one defined. So, do we want to continue? Of course, because we don't have tables defined. Now let's hit enter. As you can see, the up method has been migrated. Every time you run this command, it will check whether you have run all available migrations. If you haven't, it will run the remaining ones. So if we create a new migration right now, it won't run the movie migration anymore since we've already done that. Inside the CLI, you can also see that five SQL queries have been performed, which is correct because we have five inside the up method. So let me open the database client again. I need to refresh it. And if we scroll down, you see our movies database with our actor table, our doctrine migration version, the movie table, and the movie underscore actor table. So let's open the actor table. Right here, you'll see that we have an ID and a name. If we open the movies table, you'll find our ID, title, release year, description, and image path. I've mentioned that I will come back on the camel case convention I performed on my properties. Remember, if you look at the release year and the image path, you can tell that Doctrine stripped it with an underscore, which is incredible work. Finally, we got our pivot table, which is the movie underscore actor, which will store two integers, which is the movie ID and the actor ID. Once you start working with a relational database model, 
you will have tables that are related to each other. Doctrine provides a set of tools that will make the process of relating your entities easier than ever. It has a total of four relationships that we will cover in this video. We have the many to one relationship, the one to many relationship, the many to many relationship, and the one to one relationship. If I could give you a tip, read your relationships from left to right, where the left word refers to the current entity. My examples will be different for every relationship, so let's start off with the many to one relationship. In Symphony, the many to one relationship will tell us that there is a relationship between more than one instances of an entity, with one instance of another entity. Now let's look at an example. Let's think about five students that work on a school project. Let's speak it out from left to right. Many students are working on one project, where one project is being worked on by many students. Now how does this look? Well, we start off with our students table, which has an ID, name and age. Then we got the projects table, which has the ID, name and credits. You can simply add a foreign key to the students table of a project that will link the ID of the project to a student. There's also another possibility, but that's when you want to see what students are related to a project. So that looks like this. We'll go back to our students table with the ID, name and age. We have our projects with an ID, name and credits. And we add a table in between, which is called students projects, which has the ID of the student and the ID of a project. What this will do is grabbing your students based on the project or the other way around. Now the next relationship is the one to many relationship, which is one of the most common relationships in Symfony. If we take a look at the United States on the right side, we're talking about one big country. Inside the United States, you have different states. The other way around as well. You have multiple states, but they are all related to one country. Then we have the one-to-one -one relationship. Each row in a table has only one related row inside the second table. An example might be a person. We all know that one person has one heart. So if we speak our relationship out from the left to the right, one person has only one heart and the other way around as well. One heart can technically only be used inside one person. Now this can be realized inside your database by adding the heart ID inside the person's table and the person ID inside the hearts table. If we take a look at the example we've used in the previous video, which was the movies and actors entity, we can simply draw out the many to many relationship with actors, right? From left to right, many movies have many actors playing a role in the movie. Let's do the same thing from right to left. Many actors have starred in many movies. A movie might have one leading actor, but there are always more. You've got supporting actors, guest actors, and so on. These are all counted as an actor because they have a role in a movie. There is only one difficulty when working with the many-to-many -many relationship, since the movie entity can't have an actor ID column, and the actor entity can't have a movie ID column either. Therefore, you need to create a pivot table where the relationship can rely on. The pivot table will connect the movie table with the actor's table. There is a convention for this, since the naming of the table is done by placing the two singular table names together and separating them by an underscore. So let's say that we have our movie table where we can't have an actor ID. Otherwise, you have to duplicate the entire row with the movie name every single time. We've got an actor table, where we also can't add the movie ID since it will duplicate the actor row as well. With the pivot table, you can simply call the movie actor table, and whenever you want to get all actors that are related to a movie, you can simply call the movie actors table from the movies table that will check whether a movie ID exists or not. Up until this point, we created our database connection inside our .env file, we did set up our new database, and we created two migrations and entities through Doctrine. When it comes to coding, you don't want to add all data yourself inside a database, but you rather want to use a tool that will create dummy data for you. In Symfony, this can be done through data fixtures. So let's get right into it. We first need to make sure that we pull in the Doctrine fixtures package through Composer which allows you to create fixtures. Inside the CLI, let's perform composer require double dash dev space. Then we're going to add a doctrine command forward slash 
doctrine dash fixtures dash bundle hit enter and as you can see it's pulling it in now it has been added in dev mode so if we make our terminal a little bit smaller navigate to the explorer and open our composer.json file scroll down right here we have the require section but if we scroll down to the bottom you will see that doctrine doctrine fixtures bundle has been pulled in with a version of 3.4 or higher now why do we add the double dash dev flag every single time in most cases you don't want to push this to your development environment but you want to keep this package only to run tests when you deploy your app, you can simply tell Composer to not download these libraries. The Composer package we just pulled in has also created a new command inside the CLI. So let's make the terminal a little bit bigger again. And let me zoom in. And here, let's perform the Symfony console command. We have pulled in a Doctrine package, so let's scroll up to the Doctrine section. And I need to zoom out. All right. And right here, you can see a new command called Doctrine Fixtures Load. As the description implies, it will load data fixtures to your database. Now let's see what happens if we run this command. Let's say symphony console doctrine colon fixtures colon load. Let's hit enter. All right, it's giving us a careful slash warning sign saying that the database movies will be purged. So do you want to continue? So let's write down yes, and we will see what will happen. If we hit enter, all right, you'll see that our database has been purged and it has loaded a apps fixtures file. So let's see where this file is coming from. Let's open the data fixtures folder inside the source folder. At the top, you'll see a namespace that should make sense. Then there are two use statements right here. One is the fixture composer package we just built in. And the second one is the doctrine persistence object manager. Imagine that we're going to add dummy data inside our movie and actors table. That can be done with the persistence class, since we're going to persist data inside the desired table. Now it has a default class name of app fixtures, which is extending the fixture class. Technically, a data fixture is a PHP class with a few initialized objects. If you want to add data inside one table, I recommend you to just work in this specific file. But since we're going to add it inside two tables, I recommend you to create separate files. Now what we can do is duplicating this file. So let's select everything and copy it. Now let's create a new file inside our data fixtures folder called moviefixtures.php. Now let's paste what we just copied right here. And let's change the class name to moviefixtures, which should be equal to the actual file name that we have. Now inside the class, you'll find one method, which is the load method. So whenever you are trying to load your fixture, well, the name says it actually, the load method will be called. So what we need to do is making sure that we add some piece of code inside the load method so we can load the data through the CLI. You'll see that we have some code inside our load method. Let's delete it and let's start over. The main goal right here is creating a new object from the desired entity and then using the setters to set new data. Creating a new object should be something that you're familiar with. So what we can do is to say dollar sign movie, so object movie is equal to the keyword new, followed with the entity class. So in our case, it will be movie. Now let's hit enter to pull in our movie class inside the use statement, and don't forget to add parentheses and close it off with a semicolon. Inside the movie entity, we got a couple setters and getters that we can use right here. Now what we can do is going on the line below and saying, well, we have our movie that should have all setters, like I just said, which we can access through the access operator. So let's say dash greater than, and we're going to start off with the set title, since the set ID will be set automatically. Now let's give it a name of the dark night, close it off with a semicolon. This needs to be done for all objects. So the second one can be grabbed from the movie, set release year. Remember that this is an integer, so we don't need to add single quotes inside the parentheses. So let's say 2008. Then we have our movie description, set description, which has a piece of text of, let's say, this is the description of the dark night. Finally, we have the image path. So let's say movie set image path. 
We're going to grab the image from Pixabay. So let's navigate to Brave and let's search for Batman. And let's actually scroll down to this picture. I will add the image inside the description to save you some time, but let's just right click on it and let's copy the image address. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's add single quotes and paste it in here. With the object manager that is being passed inside the load manager as a parameter, we can make sure that we persist our movie object to the database. And that's pretty simple to do. What we can do is to go right below our last object and say, well, we have our manager access the persist method. The persist method accepts an argument and the argument that we want to pass in is the object of our movie. So dollar sign movie. All right, let's create one more movie. Let's duplicate this entire block and let's go on the line below and paste it there. Now we're not working with movie one anymore because we can't override it. So let's say movie two and let's change all object names and inside the persist method as well. Let's set the title to Avengers Endgame. The release year was in 2019. The description is, this is the description of, let's say Avengers Endgame. Now let's navigate back to Brave and let's search for, let's say Avengers. I hope that they have a picture. All right, let's scroll down and let's just copy, which one are we going to use? Let's say this one. I like this one. Let's copy the image address, navigate back to Visual Studio Code, replace the set image path value. All right. There's one more step that we need to perform, and that's making sure that we add our object manager and chain the flush method to it. So let's do that. Right below our movie two, let's call our manager object, and let's chain the flush method to it. This makes sure that both queries can be performed at the same time. It's time to run our loader one more time. Let's save the file. Let me close off this message right there. Inside the CLI, let's hit the arrow up and let's run the command. Now it's asking us if we want to erase the previous content of the table. Now, since our table is empty at the moment, let's just perform a yes. Let's hit enter. As you can see, it says that it has loaded the movie's fixture. So what we can do is to open our database client, refresh it, scroll down and open the movies table right here you will see that we have added two new movies inside our database through the fixtures now we're not completely done yet because we obviously need to have actors as well so let's do that real quick so let's go back to the explorer and there is actually no need to create a new file what we can do is renaming the app fixtures to actor fixtures now we obviously need to change the class. So let's rename F fixtures to actor fixtures. Now this should be very simple right now. Let's remove what we have inside the load method. Let's create a new object. So actor is equal to a new actor. Once again, let's pull in the class at parentheses and close it off with a semicolon. Now our actor entity has an ID, which will be added by default and simply a name. So on the line below, let's say that our actor Let's change the set name method of a value of Christian Bale. Now don't forget to persist it. So let's say manager persist and what it needs to persist is the object actor. Now let's duplicate this block, let's say three more times. All right, we're going to add two actors per movie. For Batman, we don't have Christian Bale twice, but we have heat ledger we need to change the actor object name to actor 2 all right and let's persist it as well then we have an actor for the avengers which will be robert downey jr of course which will be actor number three all right and lastly we have the man chris evans now this will be actor number four Finally, we need to make sure that we flush our data again. So let's say manager flush, save it inside the CLI. Let's hit the arrow up and we need to load our fixtures one more time. Now let's write down yes. All right, it has loaded the movie fixture and the actor fixtures. So let's open our database client. Let's refresh it and let's open the actor table. 
Right here, you will see that we have added four new rows inside the table. This is fine, but there's actually one thing that's missing right here. Since we have created a pivot table called movie actor, but if we open it, you will see that it is empty. This is happening because we have not defined anywhere inside our code that the pivot table needs to be filled. So let's do that. Let's make sure that we add data inside our pivot table as well. In most cases, you want to create a new movie and then assign an actor to it. You don't want to have an actor and then assign a movie to it, right? Which does not make sense. So let's navigate back to our explorer and let's open our actor entity. If we scroll down to the add movie function, you'll see that it will check if the movie exists and then adds an actor to it. So let's navigate back to our actor fixtures because we're going to add a reference right here. Right below the flush method, we're going to access the current object, which can be done by saying dollar sign this access operator and we're going to access the add reference method. We need to pass in two parameters right here. The first one will be a string that will be the entry identifier. So let's say actor underscore one. Then we need to add the object that we want to add a reference to. So right after it, let's add a comma space, which will be dollar sign actor. Now let's do the same thing three more times. So let's duplicate this line of code. Let's change the second one to actor two, actor three and actor four. And the same thing goes for the actor object. Second one is object two, third one is actor three and the fourth one is actor four. Next up, we need to open the movie fixtures one more time since we need to get the reference that we have set inside the actor fixtures. We basically need to tell our object which actor is related to what movie. So right below our set image path of our first movie, right above the persist, let's use our movie object. And what we're going to do is to access the add actor method that we have. Inside the add actor method, we're going to get the current object by saying this access operator get reference. Now in here, we need to get the reference that we're passing in inside the actor fixtures, which will be actor one. In single quotes, let's paste it right here. Now we need to duplicate this line of code because we want to add two actors for one movie. So let's paste it right here. Then the second one will have a reference of actor two, which is referring actor two object. And let me actually add a comment right here. Let's say add data to pivot table. And let's actually add a space here. All right. Now we can simply duplicate this and go right above our persist method, paste it right there. Now, instead of saying object movie, let's say movie two. And we're not going to reference actor one and two again, but we're going to reference actor three and actor four. And we're finally done. Let's save it. And let's actually save the actor fixtures as well. Inside the CLI, let's hit the arrow up and let me make the terminal a little bit bigger. Let's run it. Let's overwrite it one more time. As you can see, it has loaded the actor fixtures and the movie fixtures. Let's navigate back to our database client. Let's refresh it. Let's open our actors table. It has been added because the ID has increased for the movies as well. Now let's open our movie underscore actor table. And as you can see, we have added four new rows right here with the ID of our movie and the ID of our actors. It's finally time to continue on by working with our repository in Symfony. With the entity that we have defined, we pretty much defined our data structure. Then we moved on with our fixtures where we persisted data in the database. But if you remember from the last video, it also created a repository for us. Now the repository can be seen as a new layer, which is actually a little bit different than a normal MVC. In an MVC pattern, the model interacts with the database, but the model also has the entities. Symfony splits that part in two, where the repository is only the part of your application that interacts with your database. The fun part about repositories are the predefined methods that you can use. And those are the methods we will be using in this video. You can create special or even complex queries with Symfony, but that's something we'll be doing in the next video where we will be creating custom queries.
When you want to work with simple queries in Symfony, you don't need to do anything inside the repository that we have to find inside the repository folder. Let's just open the movies repository. Right there, it has a class with a constructor, but the rest is commented out. And let's just close off this file and let's move on to our movies controller and let's focus on this page first. Right now, you'll see that we have an array defined right here, which is static. So let's delete it. And we're also going to delete the entire array that we're passing to the render method. Let's remove the comma. And we're basically at the same point where we started the course, where we're just returning a simple render method with a view. Now there are a couple methods on how you could add your repository inside your controller. The first method is by simply passing your movie repository as an argument inside the index method. So let's do that. Let's say, well, we have our movie repository. Let's pull it in and let's create an object of dollar sign movie repository. What this movie repository allows you to do that we're added as an argument. Well, let me actually show it to you. What we can do right now inside the index method is to say, well, let's create a new variable called movies and let's set it equal to the movie repository object that we just created. What this allows us to do is access certain methods that the repository provides. Once again, once you want to access certain methods inside a class, you need to use the access operator. Now there are a couple methods right here that you can chain with your movie repository. Let's keep it simple right now by getting all movies that we have inside our database, which can be done with a method called find all. So remember, it's a method, so we need to add parentheses and close it off with a semicolon. Now we can pass our movie variable that we have right here directly to the view, but we can also add a dump die function where we will be printing out the movies variable that we created. So let's do that. Let's go right below. Let's say dd for a die dump. And in here, let's pass in movies. This is pretty much the same as a var dump method, but it's a little bit cleaner in the output. Let's save it. And I want to change up my interface a little bit because I want to have my browser to the right because we do need to refresh our page quite a lot. Now, if we save it and refresh the browser, and let me actually zoom out a little bit. All right, right here, you'll see that the DD method returned an array which is correct because we're finding all values from the database. And as you could see, we have two rows, which is correct because we added two rows inside the database. If we open index zero, zero, not one, you'll see that we have the Dark Knight as a movie. The release year is 2008. Description, it has an image path and it has the related actors to it. Right there, we're working with a key value pair where the key is ID title, release year, description, image path, and actors. And the values are the Dark Knight, 2008, the description, and the image path. We kind of went off topic here because I want to actually show you the different methods and how you could use a repository. What we just did was method number one. Now let's move on to the second method. Instead of calling our movie repository as an argument, let's just delete it. And what we can do is replacing it with the entity manager interface. It also needs an object, so let's say dollar sign $em, which stands for Entity Manager. Now this does not give us direct access to the method that we performed, but it kind of works in the same way. Let's delete the variable movies line, and right here, we need to define a new variable called repository, and we need to set it equal to the Entity Manager object, which we can grab from dollar sign $em, access operator, get repository. The get repository accepts one parameter, and that's the entity class that we want to associate it with. In order to do that, you need to write down the entity name. In our case, it will be movie, pull it in, followed with a double colon and the keyword class. Now this line that we just added does not get all movies that we have. What we then need to do is to do something with a repository to get all movies. So let's do that on the line below. Right here, let's create a movies variable. Let's set it equal to the repository and let's chain a new method, which is the find all method that we just performed. If we save it, navigate back to the browser and refresh it. And as you can see, the same array has been printed out with index zero and index one. Even though the first method looks like the easier one, the method we got right now on our screen is the most preferred method in Symfony, since it will give you access to way more methods that you can use. At the moment, we're only working with one method right here. But what if we have multiple? 
So let's duplicate our entire method with the route. Let's change the second one to second, the name to second, the method to second. All right, let's save it. Navigate to the browser and change your endpoint to let's say second. And as you can see, the output is exactly the same. The issue that we have right here is that we're using the entity manager twice, which can be done easier. We have it in the index method and we also have it in the second method. Now, this is also a parameter that needs to be required in multiple methods when working with a simple CRUD application. What I recommend you to do, and what I actually do in most cases, is making use of a constructor. Just a quick reminder. A constructor is a function that is being executed after the object has been initialized. So the first thing that we need to do is creating a new property at the top of our page, right above our method. The property will have an access operator of private because it's only going to be accessible throughout our movies controller. The name right here will be basically the object name that we added as an argument inside the index methods. So what we can say is dollar sign em. Now down below, we can simply create a constructor where we initialize the object or property and then setting the entity manager interface class equal to it. So let's do that. Let's say public function double underscore construct. It basically accepts the same parameter as the index method. So what we can say is we have the entity manager interface dollar sign em. Then inside the constructor, we're going to say every single time that the entity manager interface is being called, set this em, so our property up here, equal to the em parameter or argument that we have inside our constructor. So dollar sign em. Now here comes the magic trick. What we can do right now is actually remove the entire second method because it's kind of annoying. We can remove the argument that we have inside our index method. We do get an error message because it does not know where dollar sign em is coming from because we're missing the this keyword right in front of it. So right after our dollar sign, let's write down this access operator em. Let's save it. Navigate back to the browser and refresh our endpoint. Well, the second endpoint obviously does not exist. So let's say movies. And as you can see, our array has been printed out one more time. All right, now let's focus on some real repository methods. Let's actually add a comment right above our repository variable right here, where I'm going to print out the SQL command that's basically going to be performed right here. Now, the first one is the find all method, right? Which we just did. This is basically the easiest one because we're simply going to perform a select asterisk, so everything, from the table movies. Now, the second method is the find method. You basically don't need to touch this line anymore because it's doing its job but where you want to add changes is right here. So what we can do is remove all from the find method. The find method is being used when you want to perform a SQL command with a where query. So where you basically want to find a match. As you can see right now, it's returning an error message because you obviously need to pass in a clause. By default, the find method will search for an ID inside the repository. Therefore, we can simply add an integer right here of, I think it's five. Save it. Refresh the browser right here. You will see that the output is not an array anymore, but we're simply dealing with one row where the ID is equal to five and the title is the dark knight. Now in SQL terms, so let me add a comment. We're basically saying, well, the find method is saying select everything from the table movies where the ID is equal to five. The next method that we have is the find by method. So right after find, let's write down a by and let's delete the parameter. Now the find by method returns an array of objects with a given condition. So inside the parentheses, you're seeing that we have another error message. We've got to pass in a key value pair, which needs to be an array. So let's add brackets right here. And you can see that the error is already gone but it's obviously not best practice to use a find by if you don't have a condition. So inside the array, let's define a key value pair. The key inside the array will be the column where to find data by. So in our case, let's say that we want to search inside the ID column. The value, so equal sign greater than, will be how you want to order it. This can either be ascending, so from zero to 10, or descending, so from 10 to one. 
By default, it's already ascending because it always starts with the lowest number. What we can do is to say, well, single quotes, D E S C of descending. If we save it, navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you can see that the output is empty. This is happening because we're forgetting one step. Well, I'm forgetting it on purpose, to be honest. The find by method does need to have a clause, since we're going to find it by, well, some kind of clause, right? This needs to be passed in as the first parameter in the find by. Now this can be an array, so let's say brackets, comma. Right now our clause is empty, so save it, refresh the output. As you can see, our array has two items, but if we open index zero, you can see that ID starts with six now, so the other way around, and one is five. Now let's define the SQL command. So let's say comment find by. What this method will do is basically saying, well, select everything from movies again, but we're going to order it by ID. The last step is how, which is descending. The next method is the find one by method, which is pretty useful when you want to find a result based on multiple conditions. So let's delete everything that we have inside the find by method. Let's remove the method name and let's say find one by. In here, we're basically going to define two arrays. So let's already define them. Array one comma array two. Keep in mind that the second one is optional. The first array will be the condition where you want to find results for. This can be one or even multiple. And this is what makes it so powerful. So what we can do is to go inside the array and let's say, well, find me one row where the ID is equal to one. And this is fine, but we can also say comma and the title is equal to the dark night. Then for the second array that we have, which once again is optional, we can simply say how we want to sort the data. And this is actually the same as what we did before. So let's say that we want to sort it by the ID in a descending fashion. Save it, or refresh the browser. And as you could see, the output is null, which is all right because it's not throwing an error because our ID is wrong. Now, if we set it equal to five, save it, refresh it, you'll see that five has been printed out. But if we set it equal to six, save it, refresh it, you'll see that the output is null, even though the title is all right, but the ID is still wrong. Now, how will this query look like? Because this is kind of complex. Now the method name was find one by, and the query will be something like this. We're going to select everything from the table movies again, where, so first this part, the ID is six, ID is equal to six, and because we have a and clause and not an or clause, the title is equal to single quotes, the dark night. Then we're going to continue on with the second array and we're going to order it by ID in a descending fashion. Next up, we got the most straightforward method that we can add, which is the count method. So let's remove everything from the find one by and change the count method. As the name implies, it will counter the number of rows that you have inside your movie repository. At the moment, you can see that it's returning an error message right now because it requires a parameter. This can be solved if we add parentheses, save it, refresh the browser, and as you can see, the output is two, which means that we get a total of two rows inside our database. Now inside the array, we can basically do what we've done before, and it's actually giving an error message. Oh, and it's an IntelliSense error message, don't worry about that. Inside the array, we can basically do what we've done before. So we can basically say, well, get me the count where ID is equal to five. Save it, navigate to the browser, and as you could see, the output is one because there is only one row where the ID is equal to five. Now, how does this query look, which is pretty simple? We have the count, where we're simply going to select the count, which is a method, so we need to add parentheses, from the table movies, where the ID is equal to one. Now, the last one is the get class name, because there might be a chance where you need to specify the entity name, which can be done with the get class name method. So let's replace the count method with get class name, save it, refresh the browser, 
And as you can see, we're currently interacting with our movie entity that we have. Now that we've pretty much went over controllers, views, repositories, entities, I want to shift back a little bit to talk about the user interface a little bit because we're soon going to build a product. When you want to bring your front end to the next level, you need to make sure that you got a node library installed called Webpack. It's nothing new since Webpack is the industry standard tool for managing your front end assets. What it will do is basically combining your CSS and JavaScript files. In one of the first videos of this course, we went over Node, and we did install it as well. To double check if you got Node installed, you can simply perform the Node space dash V command inside the terminal. The dash V flag stands for version, so it shows you your version number. As you can see on my screen, I've got Node 16.13.0 installed, which means that I'm ready to get started. Before we get started, I got to say that we're not going to install Webpack itself because it just takes a little bit time to set up everything correctly. Symfony has an incredible library called Webpack Encore, and I will link the GitHub repository down below if you want to learn more about it. Encore is a lightweight layer on top of your Webpack, which makes your life a lot easier. It's also very simple to install it because it can be done through Composer. Inside the CLI, let's perform the Composer, require, symphony, forward slash, Webpack, dash Encore, dash bundle command. Let's hit enter and let me actually close off all folders that I have and we actually don't need in this video. All right, let's scroll down. This command will create a couple files for us. The first one is in the root of our directory, which is the package.json one. If we open it, you will first see all dependencies it's using. Then you will also see a script section right here. Now these scripts can be run inside the CLI to perform specific tasks. And this is pretty much good because we don't need to define them ourselves anymore. In most cases, you want to create scripts that will compile your CSS and JavaScript itself. So let's move on to the next file. We've also got a webpack.convic.js file right here. Let's open it. There's actually a lot of JavaScript code right here. And that's not super crazy because the file extension is .js. But if I could sum up what's going on right here is that this file will be using the Encore abstraction to configure Webpack. Now inside the Encore section right here, you can see a output path. And whenever you compile your CSS or JavaScript, it will be compiled to the public folder inside the build folder, where it will store all assets. Whenever you want to access the public path, you just need to access the set public path right here, which is forward slash build. Now if you scroll down, you can see a new entry right here. And whenever you got a new file, you'll basically have a new entry. And right here, you will see that the first entry is dot forward slash assets, so the assets folder, and we will get there in a second, with a file called app.js. You should believe me that the app.js file that you see right here includes the app.css file. It's like a small triangle with files that are connected to each other. Now, by default, it will compile CSS and JavaScript. But a pretty cool thing that the developers of Symfony have done was adding the configurations for your other styling frameworks. If we scroll down, right there, you'll see what code you need to enable SES or SCSS. You have TypeScript loaders, you have React loaders, you have an auto provider for jQuery, and this one is for hashes. An asset can be anything that is related to images, videos, markup, or configuration. With the command that we performed, Encore pulled in a new folder in the root of our directory. It starts with an A, so we need to go to the top, and right here, you see a new assets folder. If we open it, you'll find some new files and folders, such as the controllers folder, where you have a hello underscore controller, the JavaScript file, images folder, which is empty, we have a style sheet, the app.js, the bootstrap.js, and the controller.json, which we actually don't need to touch. The folder that we need is the styles folder, right here, so let's open it. In here, you will find a app.css file, so let's open it. And this kind of makes sense, right? We obviously need to add styling right here. Now there's also a app.js file, which I mentioned before. It will basically require or import the app.css style sheet that we have right here with the bootstrap style sheet. Now, if we open our app.css file one more time, you'll see that it has a default styling of the body tag up here. Now let's create a new one, let's say h1. And let's give it a font size of, let's just say 80 pixels. 
Whenever you want to use your changes inside your .css or your .js files, you got to make sure that you compile it before you can use it. When in development, you can compile assets through the encore dev command that we got inside our package.json right here. Now, whenever you want to access these commands, you need to run them through npm. You can also use other tools, but since we're using npm in this course, let's just stick to that. Now I need to save my CSS file, so let's do that. Then inside the CLI, let's say npm run dev. Now what npm will do is searching for a command inside the package.json called dev. Now let's run it, and it's running Webpack. Now apparently it has a Webpack notifier. We can install it, so let's do that. Let's copy this line, hit enter. All right, let's hit the arrow up twice and let's run the npm run dev command again. As you could see, it's running Webpack and this should be pretty fast because we don't have a lot of styling that we need to compile. It's simply the body and the h1 tag. Now remember, where did it compile to? Like I said before, we have a public folder, we have a build folder, and it has created a new app.css file. Let's open it, scroll up, and right here, you'll see a compiled version of our body and our h1. Now, how do we put this in use? I personally think that using the asset package is the best way to manage your assets. It will group all assets which share the same properties. So what we can do is to go to the CLI and perform the composer require symphony forward slash asset command. Let's hit enter and this will be done pretty quick. All right, it's finished. Now the next thing that we need to do is add our style sheet to our Twig template and that's pretty much the same way as you do it with plain CSS into an HTML file. Now the best possible way is to do it right inside of our, let's actually open the templates folder, inside our base.html.twig file because it will add it inside all other files where you require the base.html.twig file. Now as you can see it has already created a block called style sheets. Now let's remove this and we will get back to it later on. Now let's write down link and hit tab. We have a style sheet, then we have an href, but it will not be a static route like this. Let's say build, public, and so on. What we want to do is to add curly braces. Then inside our curly braces, we want to call the assets function, which is a symphony function that we can use. Now the assets function accepts a parameter, which is a string. So let's add single quotes. And what you basically want to add right here is the path to your style sheet. Now keep in mind that you don't want to put the path to the assets folder, but you want to find the file inside the build folder. By default, the assets method knows that it needs to look inside the public folder, which is awesome because we only need to find the build forward slash app dot CSS path. We currently don't have an h1 inside our index.html.twig file. So let's save this one and let's open the index file. Let's remove author. Let's create an h1. And let's say woo woo. If we save it and navigate to the browser, we do need to get back one second because I need to delete my DD. Let's navigate back, refresh it, and as you could see, woo woo has been printed out with a font size of 80 pixels. And the background color is gray. Now that was it for our CSS, but what about our JavaScript? It works in the same exact way. Let's navigate back to the code editor and let's do the same thing for our JavaScript. Let's scroll up to the assets folder. And I like to separate my assets, so a folder for my styles and a folder for my JavaScript. So let's create a new folder inside our assets folder called JavaScript. And let's create a new file right here. So let's say new file called method1.js. The reason why I'm calling it method1 is because there is a second method on how you could compile your JS. So let's do that. Let's create a new file called method2.js. Now we're not going to write down fancy JavaScript code right here. Inside the method1, let's create a simple console.log of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's save it. Let's open method2 and let's add a alert right here of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What I want to do right now is to add method1, so method1.js, inside an existing JavaScript file and method2 inside a complete new JavaScript file inside the build folder. Now before we can compile it, we need to make sure that we tell our app.js inside the assets folder 
that hey, there is a new path to method1.js where you have custom JavaScript code that you need to compile. So what we can do is to go right below our import of app.css and let's add a comment of compile new JavaScript file. What we're going to do is to simply say, well, import a string inside the string at the dot forward slash. So let's go back one directory. Let's go into the JavaScript folder forward slash method1.js. Now let's save it. Let's close off this file and let's focus on method number two which we will be adding through a new entry. So we need to open our webpack.js file. All right, let's scroll up to the entry that we have. All right, we have an entry right here. So right below, let's create a new one. Let's say dot add entry. It accepts two parameters. The first parameter will be the new file name. So let's say method two, comma. Then we need to pass in the current location of the file, which once again is single quotes, dot forward slash assets forward slash javascript forward slash method 2.js all right it's time to compile both files but before we do that i got to take a moment to talk about another command which is a bit different than the npm run dev command that we performed if we open the package.json file one more time you will also see that there is a watch command right here now the command that we performed before so the npm run dev will compile your assets once. So whenever you make a change, it won't be visible. Whenever you're going to design a lot of JavaScript, you rather want to run the watch command because it will automatically compile your JavaScripts when changes have been made. So let's test it out. Inside the CLI, let's run npm run watch. Let's hit enter. It's running Webpack. And as you could see in the CLI, it has created a new entry point called method2. If we open the public folder, you will see a method2.js file. If we open it, you'll find our alerts that we have added. Now let's open the app.js file, which should have our, well, this file is big. So let's press command F and let's search for console. All right, we have our console log of one, two, three, four, five. It's time to add these two files inside a Twig template. So let's navigate back to our base.html.twig file right here. And for this method, I'm going to stick to the Encore script tag that has been added by default right here, since it's also a pretty good method to add style sheets or JavaScript files from the build folder. What this method right here will do, so the Encore entry script tag is looking inside the build folder and then it will try to find a file called app.js. So it knows the difference between the app.css file and the app.js file. Now, if we duplicate this line of code one more time and change the second one to method2 because we have a file called method2, save it. Let's navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh the page. And as you could see, we have an alert right here. Let's click on OK, inspect the page. Let's go to our console and right here, we have a console log of one, two, three, four, five. Now, let me zoom out. Navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and let's actually close off all tabs that we have open. All right. Most people that have followed my tutorials before know that I love using Tailwind CSS. Tailwind is a CSS utility framework that makes your life as a front and back end developer a lot easier. You can see that it's a predefined CSS file where you find loads of classes that you can add on your elements to style it. And I got to admit that there were a lot of obstacles with adding Tailwind inside the Symfony project. I hope that this will change in the future. I'm not going to explain what Tailwind is because I've already got a course on it. So if you are interested, I recommend you to check it out down below. As a Laravel developer, I really liked working with Laravel Mix because it's super simple to integrate into your projects. And honestly, it's just as simple with Symfony because we've already got Symfony Encore installed. There's one thing that we need to add in between, which will be Purge CSS. Now Tailwind can be installed through the CLI. So let's run a command called npm install. We're going to start off with a flag called dash D, which is actually something you see quite often with npm. It will basically record the npm package we're going to install as a development dependency under the dev dependencies property inside the package.json file. 
Then we got to tell npm what we would like to install. In our case, it will be space tailwind CSS, space post CSS dash loader, another one which is called perch CSS dash webpack dash plugin. Then we got to say, well, we want to globally, so glob dash all pad. If we run this command, the dependencies tailwind CSS, post CSS, and perch CSS will be installed. To double check if our Tailwind has been imported, actually any package that you pull in, you can simply open the package.json file inside the root of our directory. And right here, you will see a post CSS loader inside the dev dependency section, per CSS, and Tailwind CSS. The next step is creating a configuration file inside the root of our directory where post CSS is going to require Tailwind CSS. Since we're lazy developers, we can use a mpx command to create the Tailwind configuration file for us, together with a post CSS configuration file. So inside the CLI, let's say mpx space Tailwind CSS space init, then a flag for the post CSS file called space dash p. Let's hit enter. This will create a Tailwind CSS configuration file and a post CSS one. So let's start off with the post CSS file right here i've lost it it's here what we're going to do right here is basically export tailwind css and the auto prefixer keep in mind that this is a javascript file so i'm not going to dive deep into it so just follow along let's hit a double enter right in front of module and right at the top let's create a variable called let tailwind css we're going to set it equal to the require method and inside the require method, we're going to add or search for a folder called Tailwind CSS inside our node modules. What we need to do next is to change up our plugin section that we have right here. Let's remove everything, including the curly braces. Now let's add square brackets. What we're going to do right here is adding some required files. The first one will be the variable that we created called Tailwind CSS. And let's add parentheses because we need to add a parameter right here. Let's add single quotes, and inside the single quotes, we're going to pass in the Tailwind configuration file that we have not touched, but we have created it right here. So the path will be a dot forward slash tailwind.convic.js. Then let's add a comma, and let's add a new line called require. And in here, let's add single quotes, and what we're going to require is the post CSS dash import. We need to add one more plugin, so let's add a comma. Now let's say require, and what we're going to require is the auto prefixer. Now let's save it and let's close off the file because most of the magic will happen inside the webpack file that we have in the root of our directory, right here. The dependencies that we pulled in are stored inside the node underscore modules directory. What we need to do next is to make sure that we require them inside the webpack file. Now let's take a look at our node modules folder real quick. At the top, right here. Let's open it, and this will take a while to find the T of Tailwind. Let's actually just type Tailwind. All right. Node modules is basically a package manager for node.js. Keep in mind that you don't need to change anything in here. You basically need to require everything that we have inside the Tailwind CSS folder. Let me actually close off the node underscore modules folder. All right. Now let's focus on the webpack config file. We're going to use post CSS for Tailwind. By default, post CSS is commented out inside Webpack, so let's just navigate to the bottom and let's just create it all over again. And this can actually be done anywhere inside the code, so don't worry, it does not need to be happening at the bottom. But what we're going to do right here is to say, well, enable post CSS loader. We need to add parentheses because it's a method. And you might wonder why we're adding this piece of code right here, but we got to make sure that we don't run npm run dev during development, but only on production. Now the parameter inside the enable post CSS loader will be parentheses, options. Let's hit one tick to the right to go past the parentheses, and let's create an arrow function. So a equal sign greater than curly brace. Then in here, we're going to set the options that we have equal to post CSS options. So post CSS options. Let's set it equal to curly braces. And in here, we need to configure the path to our post CSS configuration file, which will be convic is equal to single quotes dot forward slash post .js. 
Now what this will do is basically defining the directory where the post CSS configuration file is stored. The last step is adding our Tailwind directives inside our app.css file. You could also create a new style sheet, but in all honesty, you're mostly going to work with Tailwind, so it's not really necessary to have multiple CSS files for now. So let's scroll up and let's open our app.css file. Now let's remove everything that we have inside of here because we're going to add Tailwind directives that will be replaced with Tailwind code. In order to do that, we need to say add Tailwind space. Then we need to search for a file inside a Tailwind CSS folder called base. Let's do this one more time. So add Tailwind space, and we're going to pull in the components file right now. There's one more left. So add Tailwind, and the last one is called utilities. We also need to specifically tell Tailwind what file extensions need to be compiled. So let's save this file and close it off. And let's also close off the Webpack file. This can be done inside the Tailwind convic.js file, where it has a section called content. So let's go inside the array and hit enter. And we're basically going to compile files from two locations. The first one in double quotes will be the dot forward slash assets folder forward slash. We're not going to add an entire path, but we're going to add two asterisks, meaning that every single file and folder right here needs to be compiled forward slash another asterisk because we do need to define the file extensions. So let's say dot curly braces and inside the curly braces, you can add multiple file extensions. So let's say few comma JS comma TS for TypeScript comma JSX comma TSX. Now we have one more next to the assets folder. We also have the templates folder. So let's say dot forward slash templates forward slash double asterisks forward slash asterisk dot curly braces. Inside the curly braces, we got to specifically say, well, we want all HTML extensions, comma, twig extensions. Let's save it and let's close it off. Now, most people that have used Tailwind before know that you can simply run npm run dev inside your CLI. But I think that since the release of Tailwind 3, changes have been made. Now, when you want to compile your Tailwind, you need to run an mpx command. So inside the CLI, let's say mpx space, we're going to do something with Tailwind CSS. Now, let me actually zoom in a little bit inside the terminal. All right, space. Then we're going to add a dash i flag, followed with the CSS file path where we got our Tailwind directive stored. So what we're going to do is to move back one directory. We're going inside the assets folder, forward slash styles folder, forward slash app dot CSS. Then we're going to say, well, space dash o, because we need to compile it to a different file. In our case, it should be the dot forward slash public folder forward slash build folder. And let's just overwrite the app.css file. Keep in mind that if we hit enter right now, you will only see basic Tailwind classes. Tailwind 3 does not generate all Tailwind CSS classes anymore because it was a pretty big file before. What it does right now is adding a couple basic stylings but if you add the dash dash watch flag, it generates new classes that you add inside your twig. So let's hit enter. And apparently I made a typo. All right, I see it right here. Excuse me. Let's hit enter. Now the watch flag compiles your style based on changes that you have made. Right now it has rebuilt it once, but we're not making any changes, so it's not rebuilding it anymore. Now let's open our compiled file. Let me actually zoom out. All right. Let's open the app.css file and right here, you will find a couple Tailwind classes that you could use. If we scroll through the page, you will see some classes, but definitely not all of them. You'll see that the last styling is a dot block class name. In the last video, we already added our style sheet to our base.html.twig file. So let's check it out inside of the browser. Let me close off the console. Let's refresh it. All right, woohoo has been printed out, which is all right with a different styling than before. Now here comes the real magic of Tailwind CSS. If we navigate back to our code editor and let's open the index.html.twig file and let's add a class to our h1. Let's say bg-blue-500 to change the background color. Let's set the text to 2xl. Let's center the text, so text-center space font dash bold. 
if we save it and navigate to the browser, refresh it, you'll see that Woohoo has been printed out with a blue background color, it has been centered, and the font size is bigger. If we then, for the last time, navigate back to the code editor and open our app.css file, which is the compiled version, you'll see that new classes have been added right after the block class name of bg-blue, text center, text to Excel, and the font bold, which we have added inside our H1. On web pages, images play an important role. A best practice might be to save the image path that users upload inside a database and save them inside the public folder. In this video, we're going to add a static image inside our project directory and print it out inside the browser. Just like the CSS and JavaScript file, you'll be using the compiled version from the public directory, which is then available throughout the browser. Images don't need any processing, which is a good thing. So what we can do is to navigate to the browser, now let's open a new tab and go to pixabay.com. Let's just click on a random image, let's say this one. All right, now let's click on free download and let's download the image. All right. As you can see right now, I'm inside the movies folder, which is my Symphony project. Let's open the public folder. In here, you will find a build and index file. What I recommend to do is adding a new folder right here with the name of images where we're going to store our image. So let's click on it, and I've got my image right at the bottom. Let's drag it in, and let's just rename it to make it a little bit easier, called image one. Now this should be accessible from the view. Let's navigate back to our code editor, and right inside of our index.html.twig, let's create a image tag. All right, the source will be grabbed from the assets folder, like we did in the last video. So let's say asset, the path will be images, forward slash image one dot jpeg. Now let me actually double check the file extension. All right, that's correct. Now let's keep the alt empty for now. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's go to our local host. Let's refresh it. And as you can see, the background image is visible. Now this was super simple, but it isn't the right way. The public folder is, well, public. You usually want to hide everything from your user. Now since we already got Encore set up, which gave us the assets folder in the root of our directory, right here, it compiles the CSS and JavaScript. So why shouldn't it compile another asset, which will be the image? First, we got to make sure that we install a file loader through npm. So let me actually get out of my rebuilding phase. Let's say npm install, a package called file-loader, and we're going to add it in safe mode. So let's say double dash save dash dev. Let's hit enter. All right. Now, as you could see inside the assets folder, it already has an image folder. So what we can do is to drag our image inside the images folder. Let's move it because I'm very sure that I want to do that. Whenever you want to add behavior to your encore, you got to make sure that you do that inside the webpack convict file. So let's open that. Now inside the Encore section, which starts right here, we can use a new method. So let's go to the bottom again. All right, right below where my post CSS loader, let's say dot copy files, which is a method. Inside the method, we need to add curly braces and hit enter. And we are basically going to reference an image file from outside of a JavaScript file, which will then put inside the final output directory. So in here, we need to make sure that we define some keys and values. The first key will be from, colon, and the value will be a string. Let's keep it empty for now and move on to the second one on the line below, because we want to copy files from somewhere to another location, which will also be a string. And finally, we have a pattern that we're going to add. Let's keep it empty. It's not going to be a string. Now let's assign our from key a value. So in here, we're basically going to define where the images are stored. In our case, it will be one directory back, assets folder, images folder. Then we need to define a new path inside the public folder where we want to compile it to, which will be images, forward slash. We're going to add a couple wildcards right here, which can be done by adding a set of brackets, 
inside the brackets, our first wildcard will be the path. Then we have another wildcard, which will be the name dot. We're going to add a hash. So wildcard called hash colon eight dot followed with the file extension inside a wildcard, which will be ext. So the file extension. Now these wildcards will basically be replaced with values. Now, finally, we have our pattern, which will not be a string like I said before. And this is basically a regex. So let's say forward slash backslash dot parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we're going to define the extensions that we're going to allow. The first one will be PNG, pipe, JPEG, pipe, JPEG. Then outside of our parentheses, we're going to add a dollar sign forward slash. Let's save it. Now let's run the npm run dev command inside the CLI to compile our assets once. It has been compiled with errors, but that has nothing to do with the images. So if we scroll up inside our build method, you'll find an images folder with a file name called image one dot a hash dot JPEG, which is the file extension. If we open it, you'll see the same image. All right, now how do we output this to the browser? Well, pretty much in the same exact way. Let's close it and go back to our index.html.twig file. Right now, the assets method will look inside the images folder and it will search for a file called image1.jpg. If we refresh our browser, because the file has a different name right now and it's stored in a different location. Now, the assets folder will look inside the public folder. So let's remove the entire path. And what we're going to do right here is to say, well, look inside the build folder, forward slash images folder, and search for an image called, what was the name? Image 1.727060c7.jpg. Save it, navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh the page, and as you could see, the image is printed out again. We're not going to apply validation, middlewares, and so on, but we're simply going to focus on CRUD's functionalities. For developers that are pretty new to coding and have no idea what CRUD is, let me briefly explain it. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete, which are the four primary operations that web applications most commonly provide on a resource. If we think about a blog, you can create a new post, you can read the post, you can update a post, and you can also delete a post. In this video, we're primarily going to focus on reading stuff from the database. I don't want to spend too much time on creating a complete front-end application, so I have done that before I recorded the video. I will share the GitHub link down below where you will find Tailwind code, with HTML of course, for the front-end part. I've also got it open inside a browser, so let's navigate to Google Chrome. And right here, we must know by now that views are stored inside a template folder, so let's open it. And before we focus on the movies folder that I also have right here, let's quickly open the base.html.twig file. Whether you have installed my previous video where we installed Tailwind or not, I have added a CDN, as you can see right here, of Tailwind CSS, so don't worry about your Tailwind part. I've also created a responsive navbar, so I've added Alpine CDN on the line below, right here, that works perfectly fine with Tailwind. Besides that, I've also created three blocks in my main content. One is for my header, right here, we have a block called header. We got a second block, which is down below, right here, which is for the body. So the actual content of our pages will be right here. And the third block is our footer, right here, which will just simply print out a copyright at the bottom. Now let's navigate to the top of this page because GitHub gives us an option to copy the entire file. Right at the right side of your GitHub, you will find a couple icons. Now let's click on the second one, which will copy raw content. So what we can do then is navigate back to our code editor, because we're going to replace the entire base.html.twig file that we have with the content that we just copied. So let's select everything and paste it right there. Scroll to the top and that's done. So let's save it and close off the file. The next thing that we need to do is to create our new movies folder that we have. Let me show it to you right here. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Inside the templates folder, let's create a new folder called movies. And this is a structure that you got to get used to. 
if you're going to work with a certain endpoint, like we're going to do with movies, just create a movies folder and add all pages that belong to the movies endpoint in here. I've already explained the CRUD operations. So let's simply create four files in here. So let's right click, let's say new file. The first one will be the index.html.twig file. We need a second one, so let's create a new file. And this page will basically show one specific post or movie to a user, which can be done by saying show.html.twig. So the index page will show all movies that we have in the database, and the show method will show one single movie. A user has the opportunity to create a new movie review. So let's create a new file and let's give it the name of create.html.twig. Finally, we get a page where a user can edit a movie. So let's do the same thing. One more file called edit.html.twig. You might wonder what the delete page might be since it's also an operation in CRUD, but we only need to add a delete button that will delete one single post. Now let's quickly copy paste all the pages that we have inside GitHub. All right, let's open the movies folder. And let's just start off at the top with our create.html.twig file. Let's copy the content inside of it, navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the create.html.twig, paste it inside of it, save it, and let's just close it off. Now let's do it one more time. Let's copy the edit.html.twig file, copy the content, open the edit, paste it, save it, and close it off. There are two more left, so navigate back, copy the index page, navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and paste it right here, save it, close it off. Now one more time, open the show, copy the content, navigate back, paste it in, save it, and close it off. Now the routes obviously don't work anymore inside our project since we've moved all pages inside a movies folder. Let's start off with the index.html.twig file, which will be the forward slash movies endpoint. Let's open the movies controller that we have, and we already have one route defined, which is forward slash movies, and it's returning a view to index.html.twig. Now the route that we have is all right, because it's forward slash movies, and the name is movies, which is completely fine right now. The render method looks inside the templates folder, but not further than that. So what we need to do is to add movies right in front of it and add a forward slash. If we save it, let's navigate back to the browser. Let's go to our local host and let's refresh it. And right here, you will see the index.html.twig file. The data that is currently being showed is still static. So let's fix that up. So we somehow need to make a database call, right? So let's think about that for a second. We want to interact with our movies table inside the database. So what do we need to do? First off, we need to make sure that we connect with our movies repository. So what we can do is to go to Visual Studio Code and create a new private property called movie repository. Let's also define a constructor right below of it. So public function, double underscore construct. Now let's add the movies repository that we have defined inside our repository folder as an argument, so let's say movie repository, let's pull it in, object called movie repository. What we can do inside our constructor is saying that every time the movies controller is being called, assign our movie repository that we have right here to the private property that we got that is only accessible inside the movies controller. That can be done by saying this movie repository is equal to the movie repository as an argument. So variable movie repository. So what's next? We should be able to retrieve all movies right now that we have inside the database. So inside the index method, we're currently doing nothing actually. We're just rendering a view. What we can do is to go right above our return method and define a new variable called movies. And let's grab the movies repository that we have with a keyword this because it's going to search for a property in this file called movie repository and we're going to chain one more method right here called find all what the find all method does is searching for all movies that we have inside our movie table before we send our movies back to the front end let's double check if this works right below our variable movies let's create a dd to die dump our variable movies if we save it and navigate back to the browser refresh it 
the database returned an array with two rows, which we will check out later on. Now there are two possible ways on how you could send data back to the view. The first one is adding a variable that we have right here called movies right inside of the render method. Now the second method is just returning this piece of code that we have right here and removing the variable movies. For demonstration purposes, let's just return back our variable movies. So let's remove the DD. As we've seen in the output, let me show it one more time. We've got an array right here. So we need to make sure that we return an array to the view. Right after our first argument inside the render method, let's add a comma, space, and we're going to send back an array. So let's say a set of brackets. Right here, we need to make sure that we define a key value pair. The key will be accessible in the view, while the value will be the movies variable that we got. So let's say single quotes, movies, and the key is variable movies that we have. What we also could have done, and it's completely up to yourself, is returning this piece of code right here, instead of variable movies, then you can simply delete this line and you don't need a semicolon. This works fine. For demonstration purposes, I'll just stick to this method because it's a little bit easier for beginners to understand what's going on. Now the array that we just passed through should be accessible through the view. So if we save it and open the index.html.twig file, we should replace static content right here with values from the movie array. Keep in mind that we can simply define movies or blog posts inside our view like this. If we save it, navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh the page, you'll see that an error message is thrown since we're trying to access an array right here as a string. So what we got to do is creating a loop as a single movie item. So let's navigate back. Let's remove what we have right here. And I've also added comments for every block item. So let's actually delete two of them because we only need one. So let's delete this one as well. So let's create a loop right below our block item comment. Let's write down for and hit tab, which creates a for each loop for us. We're going to loop inside our movies array as one single movie. Now let's copy the end for loop. All right, let's go to the bottom in between the two closing divs and paste it right here. Now I don't like the alignment, so let's select everything inside our loop. All right, and let's hit tab. This looks fine. Now this doesn't work because you can see that Avengers and the paragraph tag are still static. So let's replace the content that we have right here. And let's start at the top with our image path. So let's remove everything inside of it, add twig snippets and write down movie since we're looping over the entire array and every item will be one single movie. And we're going to print it out, which can be done by writing down dot as image path. Now the same thing needs to be done for the H2, which will be the title. So let's add curly braces. Let's access the movie dot title. Now let's keep the span that we have as it is since that will be something for one of the next videos where we will be focusing on authorization and we will add a middleware all around our movies. Then we get our paragraph tag right here, which will basically be the content or the description. So let's remove the lorem ipsum text, add twig snippets, say movie.description. And that should be it. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to the browser and let's refresh it. And as you could see, Two movies have been printed out coming from our database. Now let's add one more functionality right here. I do want to see how many movies we got inside our loop. If you're familiar with PHP, you know that you can use the count method. I've told you before that Twig is extremely powerful. So let me show you what I mean with that. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's scroll to the top right inside of our H1, add a set of parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we're going to use some Twig syntax. So let's add Twig snippets. And in order to count the values of an array, we simply need to write down the array name, which will be movies, add a pipe, which allows you to perform all types of actions. What we need is the word length. During this course, we will go over some others that you can use as well. But for now, let's save it. Let's navigate back to Chrome, refresh the page. 
And as you can see, the number two has been added right after our H1 title, meaning that we have two values inside our array. This hasn't anything to do with our CRUD operations yet. Well, technically it has something to do with it, since we need to read a movie based on the ID, which can only be grabbed in this way. As you can see, both posts have a read button right here. Keep reading. This is the R of the CRUD operation, since we're going to read one single post. When you want to read one specific post, you basically need to add a route parameter since the post might change, based on the movie you have clicked on. The first step that we need to take is changing up the href in our answer. If we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see our keep reading button right here, and I've only added forward slash block forward slash. Let's change this up to forward slash movies forward slash where we're going to add something that's unique to the movie row. In our case, it will be the actual ID. So what we can do is add blade snippets. Inside of it, say movie.id. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh the page, click on keep reading of the dark knight, you'll see that the endpoint does not exist, which is all right, but the ID is one. Navigate back, open the Avengers, you'll see that the ID is number two. Now we're currently getting an error message that the route does not exist, which is all right. So let's fix that as well. Let's navigate back to the code editor and let's open our movie controller. All right, because we're going to create a new method that will show this specific page of one single post. What we actually can do is duplicating the method that we have right here. So let's just do that. All right. And let's start off with the annotations. Right here, it's going to forward slash movies. That's all right, but we need to add the route parameter. So let's say forward slash curly brace ID. There's one more thing that we need to add right here, which is the methods, colon, brackets, and the value is get, because we're going to perform a get request since we're getting values from the database. This can actually be applied to the index method as well. So let's copy it and add it right in front of name. All right, now let's scroll down again. This ID that we're having right here will change over time that we need to grab inside the method. So let's say dollar sign ID. It's still the index method. So let's change this up to the show method. We still need a response, which is all right, but we're not going to grab all movies anymore, but one single movie based on the ID. Now the method that we're chaining at our movie repository is defined all which is not correct when you want to get one single value. So let's remove all, but the find method accepts a parameter, which will be the ID you want to search for. In our case, it will be variable ID that we have right here as an argument inside our show method, which will crumb from the endpoint right here. All right, we're almost done. Since we're not going to render the index view, but the show view. We're also not sending back multiple movies, but one single movie. All right, let's navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh the page. And as you can see, the endpoint works, but the content is still static. So let's change that up real quick. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the show.html.twig method, and let's scroll to the top. Now we don't need to create a loop right here since we got an object of one row and not multiple. So what we can do is simply replacing Joker with curly braces, movie dot title. We're not going to change the H2 yet and also not the small paragraph. Scroll down. We have the image, so let's change that up to movie dot image path. We have multiple paragraphs, but let's just remove two and let's change up the lorem ipsum that we have right here to movie dot description. Now this should do the trick for us. If we save it and navigate to the browser, refresh the page, you'll see that the page has been changed to Avengers Endgame. The image is correct and the description has been added as well. Let's go back to our movies page one more time. Let's click on the keep reading button of the Dark Knight. And as you can see, the Dark Knight's page has been printed out as well. This was it for this video where I showed you how you can output all movies that we got inside the database on the screen, followed with one single post as well.
In the last video, we imported the index, show, edit, and update pages I got inside my repository into our current project. In this video, we will continue on with our mini CRUD application where we will be focusing on creating a new movie. In most cases, when you will be building a block or something related to CRUD, you will be having a create button somewhere in your homepage. If we navigate back to the browser, you actually won't be seeing a create button. So let's add that ourselves. Usually a create button is right above the content and somewhere below the header. So let's add it right here. Let's navigate back to the code editor and let's open the index.html, the twig file and right above the div that has a class of grid, let's create a new div and let's give the div a class and let me actually zoom in. All right, let's give it a class of mx-auto, so margin zero auto. And let's give it a width of four dash five and the margin Y, so top and bottom, is equal to 8. We don't need to create a form in here because we're not going to make a request yet. We're simply going to show a button where a user can click on to get access to the create page, but the create page will have a form itself that will be handled inside the controller. So inside our div, let's create an answer with a text of create new movie. We already have the create.html.twig file, so let's define it as a href. So forward slash movies, forward slash create. And let's also add a class to it of uppercase. Let's add a border, a border dash gray dash 500. The text is large, so LG. The padding Y axis is four and the padding X axis is six. And let's also add a rounded for the corners and the BG is gray dash 800, and let's set the text equal to white. Now let's save it and navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, and as you can see, we have created a new create new movie button. Now if we open our create.html.twig file, you'll see something you might be familiar with if you have worked with HTML before. We got a simple form, so our opening form tag, we have an input field, text area, another input field, a button, and our closing form tag. I've added this on purpose since it's not the correct way in Symfony to use requests. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say not the correct way, but there is a way better approach for this. What you do want to have is having forms inside Symfony, which will be a bit different than we got right now. In most cases, you don't want to repeat yourself every single time. Symfony offers a powerful form feature that allows you to simplify your code. But before you can use it, you need to make sure that you pull in the right package of Symfony. So let's do that inside the CLI. Let's say composer require symphony forward slash form. If we hit enter, you'll see that all packages that are needed will be pulled in from symphony's form. And with the command that we just performed, we got the opportunity to generate a form class, which is something quite new. So let's do that. And let's then dive into what it actually does. Inside the CLI, let's perform the symphony console make command. What we're going to make is a new form called movie form type, which will be the class name. And you also have the option to associate the model you want to use with it, which will be space called movie. Let's hit enter. Now what this command will do is creating a new folder called form inside the source folder with a PHP class called movie form type. Now let's open it. So let's open the form folder and the movie form type. All right. Inside the build form method right there, you'll see all properties that our movie entity uses. So the title, release year, description, image path, and the actor. Now, what is a form type? A form type basically describes the form fields that are associated to our entity. It converts the data between submitted data from a field to the entity class property. With the form type that we just created, we can easily create new form types inside the front end that will automatically be associated with the properties in our entity. At the moment, you'll see that our actors object has been changed inside the builder object. I want to comment this out for now and get back to it later on when we are going to add data inside our relationship tables. If we scroll down, you'll see our configure options method where you can set the default data class. At the moment, it has been set equal to movie colon colon class, which we've done inside the CLI, but you can change it up right here if you want to, which is actually not something I recommend you to do since the file name and class name should have a link between the operations you're trying to perform. We have a movie form type, which is using the movie entity class. 
With form types, you don't build your form inside the front end, but inside the controller, which might seem weird, but you're technically going to use a form builder object, which allows you to describe the form fields using a fluent interface. So let's navigate to our movies controller, and right below our index methods, let's create a new one. Well, let's start off with the annotations. So hashtag brackets, and inside the brackets, we have a route method. The first param will be the route, which will be single quotes, forward slash movies, forward slash create. Then we have a comma right after our first parameter because we have a name, colon, single quotes, create underscore movie. Now let's go right below our annotation and create a new method. So public function create. The create method will return a response. So colon response. Now let's add the curly braces. Now think about it. What are we going to create? Well, obviously a new movie. So let's make sure that we instantiate a new movie object inside our create method. So let's say variable movie is equal to new movie. On the line below, we need to make sure that we instantiate the form type. So let's define a new object called form and let's set it equal to this create form which is a method. And what this method will do is converting the data to a format that can be used inside a Twig template. Now the create form method accepts two parameters, as you could see, because it's throwing an error. The first one will be the movie form type we just created. So let's say movie form type. Make sure that you pull it in by hitting enter, colon, colon, class. Let's add a second parameter, so comma, which will be the movie object that we have created right above. So let's say dollar sign movie. These two are useful, but we still need to make sure that we send it back to the view. This should be well known by now. So right below our form object, let's say return this render. And what we're going to return is first the path. So movies forward slash create dot html dot twig comma array. We're going to send back one item right here, which will have a key of form. And the value will be our form object. And we're going to create a view which is a method. Now let's save it and navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's refresh the page and click on create new movie. And as you can see, the create page is visible right now. All right, let's make use of our form type inside the view. It's a bit different compared to what we got right now. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and open the create.html.twig file. Right here, you'll see a simple form tag with an action method and ink type. Now let me show you what you can do with form types. So right below of it, let's create Twig snippets. Write down form underscore start, which is the opening form tag. And inside the parentheses of our form tag, we got to pass in the key of the array that we just passed through from our controller. As you can see, it is called form. So let's say form. Now what we have right here will do exactly the same as what we got above. So let's remove that. And all right, let's align it. And just like the actual form tag, you got to make sure that you close it off as well. So let's do that. So let's go right to the bottom, replace our form closing tag with curly brace, form underscore end, and let's pass in inside the parentheses our form. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will see all of our previous input fields, but also a set of new ones right below of the submit button. And these are the correct input fields based on the properties we got defined inside our movie entity. So let's go back and let's basically delete everything we had from before. So this div, we don't need the text area and input field, but we do need the button to, well, submit it. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you will see that we still have our button, but the input fields have been placed right below of it, which is pretty weird. Now this can simply be fixed by adding a form rigid right above your button. So let's go right above our button. Let's add twig snippets. Let's say form underscore widget, which is a method that accepts the form. So let's pass that in, save it, navigate back, refresh it. And as you could see, the input fields that are created by our form are above our submit button right now. What the form widget eventually does is basically controlling all the input fields that we have. Now, if we navigate back to Google Chrome one more time, you can see that it obviously has removed all stylings we had on our previous input fields. 
Now this is kind of a tricky part because you can add your stylings in either the controller, form type, or even right inside of your view. Personally, I like adding it inside the form type, so let's do that. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and open our movie form type. Let's scroll up. Now let's start off with a title. Let's add a second parameter right here by saying comma, space, because we need to define what the type of our input field is. In our case, we're dealing with a title, so that can't be an integer or whatever, which is a string. So let's simply say text type, colon, colon, class. There might be a chance, and that's actually what I get most of the times, that the wrong text type class will be pulled in. So let's add it manually. Right inside of our use statement, let's say use symphony backslash component, and I'm not gonna say backslash, so every time I say a new word, just expect a backslash. Form, extension, core, type, text type. Now let's scroll down to our title again, because the add method also accepts a third parameter. So let's add a comma right after our text type, and it should be an array. So let's add brackets and hit enter. In here, you can pass lots of classes, attributes, and so on to customize your input field. I will add a link down below because I can make like 100 videos based on the things you can add right here. So let's just stick to what we need. First of all, we need to start off by adding a key value pair. The first key will be called ATTR, which stands for attribute, and the value of it will be another array. So instead of using brackets, let's just pass in the array method. Now let's go right inside of the array method and hit enter, because we need to add another key value pair right here. Now the first one is for styling, so let's say single quotes class, and the value is basically a string that will be added inside your input field. Now these will basically be the same as the input fields we had before, so you can just copy paste them and I'll just quickly type them. BG dash transparent, block border dash B dash two, the width is full, the height is 20, the text is 6XL, and the outline is none. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you'll see that our input field looks a lot better, but the placeholder is missing. Now that can be added as an attribute as well. So right after our class, let's add a comma, now let's say placeholder, while the value is enter title. Save it, navigate back, refresh it, and as you can see, the placeholder of enter title has been added. Now, there's one thing that's bothering me, and that's the title label that we have. So let's turn that off. Let's navigate back. And a label can either be true or false. In our case, it has a default value of true, which means that the label is always visible. To turn it off, we simply need to overwrite the value and turn it to false. But be aware that this needs to be done right outside of our array attribute. So let's add a comma and let's define a new key value pair of label and the value is false. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you'll see that our label for title has been removed. Now we still have our release year and description that we need to fix. The image takes a bit longer, so let's just focus on release year first. I don't want to rewrite everything that we just done, so let me basically copy everything that we have up until the comma for title. Now let's go right after our release here and hit backspace to delete the parentheses and paste what we just copied. Now the release here is an integer and not a text type. So let's replace that with integer type. It will have the same class, but let's actually add a MT of 10. So a margin top of 10. The placeholder is not enter title, but enter release here. And I don't want to see the label. Now, just like the text type, we do need to create a use statement for the integer type. But what we can do is just simply copy what we just had for the text type and replace it with integer type. Save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh it. And as you can see, we have our release here, which can be an integer. Now let's do the same thing for our description real quick. Let's copy everything. Go after our description. All right. Now our description is not an integer type or text type, but it is a text area type. It does have all the other classes, but instead of saying height 20, let's say height 60 to make it a bit longer. 
and the placeholder is enter description. Save it. Now let's scroll up because we do need another use statement for our text area type. Save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh it, and this looks a lot better than what we had. Finally, we got our image path, which should be a file upload because we're going to store an image on our local system and save the actual path of our image inside our database. So let's navigate back. Once again, let's copy everything from the comma inside our ad method, paste it inside the image path. The image path is not a text area, but it is a file type. Now we don't need all those classes, but we do need a padding Y axis of 10. And we also don't need a placeholder because it will be added automatically. So last time, copy our use statement and replace the value to file type. Save it, navigate back to the browser and refresh the page. And as you can see, we have a upload button right at the bottom. Now we just created a view with a lot less code than before. Let me show that real quick. Right here, we just created a view with a total of 21 lines, which is pretty insane. Right now, we reached the point where we're going to handle the submit of our button. So let's navigate back to the controller, so our movies controller, and let's add some logic inside the create method that we have. Whenever you want to access user data through forms, you can use an instance of the request object. The request object allows you to access all the ways users can provide input to your site. Now, the request object needs to be added inside the create method as a parameter. So let's say request. Don't forget to pull it in. And let's create an object called dollar sign request. Through the object request that we just created right here, we got access to all values that the user submits through our form. In a framework like Laravel, you create two methods to handle what you're going to do right now. The first one is the create method, which will show the create page we just created. Then there's another method which will persist data right inside of the database and redirects a user to the overview page. In Symfony, we can simply do this in one method. What we need to do is telling our form object that we want to handle a request. Now this can be done by going right below our form object and saying, well, get our form object. And let's chain the handle request method to it. What it needs to handle is our request object that we're passing in inside our create method. So let's pass it in right here. Whatever is happening on the screen right now happens when the create page is being loaded. We're performing a get request. We actually need to perform a get and post request inside one method. This can easily be done by creating an if statement right below our handle request where we're going to check whether our form, now let's change the is submitted method, and so double our ampersand, the form is valid. Now the left side of the condition, so the is submitted method, make sure that we're dealing with a post or put request, while the is valid method, so the right side of our condition, checks whether the fields are valid. Now the next thing that we need to do is to make sure that we store the values we got from our request inside a variable. So let's define a new variable inside our if statement called new movie. And let's set the value equal to our form object. And we're going to change the get data method to get the data of our form request. Now, before we continue on, let's debug this piece of code. So let's say dd new movie. And let's also add an exit. Save it, navigate back to Chrome and refresh the page. Enter a title of Hulk. 2008, and let's say a Hulk description. Let's choose a file, which I have on my desktop, which is a basic image. Let's submit it. And as you could see, whoops, that was a bit too much. You'll see that the output has an ID of null, which is good because we haven't pushed it to the database yet. And once it reaches the database, Symfony will create a unique ID for it. The title is correct, which is Hulk. The release here is correct. The description is correct. And the image bit, well, is correct, but also not correct. What we're going to do right now is focusing on the image path. So let's navigate back and let's remove our exit and DD. And let's create a new variable right here called image path. And the value will be our form. We're going to get one specific value 
from this list that we have inside of our browser, what we're trying to get is actually a key. And the key that we want is the image path. So let's say image path. And don't forget to chain the get data method to only get the right side of the value. So basically this piece of code right here. We do need to perform a check to see whether the image path has been set or not. Once again, let's go right below of it and let's create a if statement. Inside the if statement, we're simply going to check, well, is image path set or not? Return a true or false. Now you don't want to save the image file with a file name that the user submits it to, since users can upload different images with the same name. What we can do is defining a new variable inside our if statement where we will replace the name. So let's say variable new file name. And what we're going to use for this is called unique ID, which is a method that will generate a random ID. And we're going to concatenate a dot because we do need to add the file extension back to it, which can be done by saying, well, we have our image path. Let's say dollar sign image path. And let's change the guess extension method to it. Now then we need to make sure that we try to move the image to a location inside our local project. So right below of our new file name, let's create a try. We will add a catch in a bit, but let's just focus on the try first. What we're going to do right here is to say, well, we have our image path. Now let's change the move method to move it to a different location. The move method accepts two parameters and let's actually go inside of it and hit enter. The first parameter will be the location where you want to store it. In our case, it can be done by saying this get parameter, which will grab a local parameter that we have called kernel dot project underscore there. And what this basically will do is getting the root path of your project. And we're not done yet because we do need to concatenate a new string to it called forward slash public forward slash uploads. So it will look inside the public folder. Where is it? Right here for a uploads folder that we will create right now. So let's say uploads. The second parameter will be the new file name. So right after our get parameter method, let's add a comma and let's say, well, get me this piece of code right here. We're not done yet because chances are that this goes wrong. So let's make sure that we send back a message to the user. Right after our try, let's create a catch. The catch has parentheses, I forgot to say that. And what we want to check right here is the file exception method. Let's pull it in and let's create an object called E for error. Then inside our catch, whenever it goes wrong to move an image, let's say return a new response called object E and change the get message method to it. Now we're almost done. We do get to make sure that we update the image path from our input fields to the updated image path which simply can be done by using the setter of our image path that has been created inside the entity. So let's go right outside of our catch and say that we have our new movie and let's chain the set image path method to it, which comes from the movie repository. Now this accepts a string as a parameter. So let's add single quotes, which will be forward slash uploads, forward slash. Let's concatenate the new file name to it. So let's say dollar sign, new file name. Now what we're doing right here will be the column image path inside our database. So simply a string of uploads with a new file name and the extension. The last step that we got to perform inside our controller is outside of our if statement of our image path. So basically this block that we have. All right. And if you have watched my previous videos, you should be familiar with the two steps. So we got to make sure that we first persist our entity manager interface and then flush the data. Now, before we can do that, we obviously need to pull in our entity manager interface. So let's go to the top, right above our constructor. Let's create a new property called private EM. Inside our constructor, let's add another parameter called entity manager interface, object EM. Then inside the constructor, let's say that this em is equal to variable em. Save it and let's go to the bottom, right where we were. Let's say this em 
and let's persist data. The data that we want to persist is our new movie. So dollar sign new movie. Now don't forget to flush it. So this em flush. Now there's one more line that we need to add and that's basically making sure that we redirect the user once it has been persisted. You don't want to stay on the create page. So right below our flush method, let's say return, this redirect to route, which accepts the name of a method, which in our case will be movies. Now movies will refer to the index method right here, where we have defined inside our annotations a name called movies. Now let's test it out. Let's save it and navigate back to Chrome. Let me zoom out. Let's refresh the page and resubmit the form. And as you could see, we just received an error message because we completely forgot to import a package. And this is just for our image path extension that we want to add to a file. So let's navigate to Visual Studio Code. Inside the CLI, let's paste the composer require symphony forward slash mime. And this is the issue when you work with a skeleton project, you might forget packages here and there. Let's navigate back to the browser. Let's refresh it one more time and resubmit it. And I have a typo because it's project underscore dir. Excuse me again. Right here, it's not dit. Save it, navigate back. And I'm 100% sure that this is the last refresh. And as you can see, we have a total of three movies inside our array and Hulk has been added. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the uploads folder, you'll see that we have a new image with a file extension of .jpg with a unique ID, and it is the image of our new movie. Now let's navigate back to our database client, open the movies table, and right here you'll see a new movie called Hulk with a image path that has been set to the public folder, uploads folder, and this file that we just created. Updating a post will be quite similar to creating a post. We simply need to have the same fields, but with values defined as our current post. The biggest difference is the image, because you only want to update an image path in the database if there is a new attachment in your request. So let's see how we can fix that. First, we got to make sure that we have an edit button somewhere in our item. In most cases, you will be having it on a specific post, since you need to work with that current ID. If we navigate back to our movies overview, and let's click on keep reading on Hulk, we somewhere need to add a button right here. Let's navigate back to the code editor, and let's open the show page, and let me actually close off a couple tabs. We don't need the create and the index, all right, and the form type, excuse me. Let's open the show page, and let's scroll to the bottom, right below our paragraph, let's add an answer, so A and hit tab. Let's add a text of edit movie. Let's give an href of forward slash movies, forward slash edit, forward slash twig snippets. And inside the twig snippets, we're going to say, well, edit one specific movie by the ID. Now we're also going to add a class. So let me actually align this on the line below. All right. Now let's say class will be equal to bg green 500 for the background. The font is bold, padding y axis is 2, padding x axis is 4, round it, let's add a transition of all, and once a user hovers over it, so hover a colon, the bg will change to 300. Let's save it and navigate to the browser, refresh it, and as you can see, our edit button has been added right here. If we click on it, you'll see that we have been redirected to our local host, movies, forward slash 14. It doesn't work because we haven't defined the route yet. So let's go back to our controller and right below our create method, let's define a new annotation. It has a route method and inside the route method, we're going to pass in the path, which will be the same that we added inside our answer. So forward slash movies, forward slash edit, forward slash one specific ID. And let's add a second parameter of the name, which will be a string of edit underscore movie. 
Now we obviously need to define the method right below of it. So let's say public function edit. It needs to return a response. So let's say colon response. Now let's add curly braces. Now we do have a route parameter, which we need to use inside the edit methods. So let's pass it in as a parameter. So variable ID. And what we simply can do is add a DD to double check if it works over ID and let's add a exit. Save it, navigate back to Chrome, refresh the page. And as you could see, ID is number 14. We have a extra space right here, which might bother us. So let's go to our show page and let's remove the extra space that we got. All right, let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's remove the DD and exit. Now that the flow of our application works for the edit method, let's move on to the next step, which is something we have done before. We do want to show a user something. So we need to make a database call to get the right row based on the ID that has been passed through. So let's define a new variable called movie and let's set it equal to this movie repository. And let's change the find method because we're going to find a movie based on this ID. So let's say dollar sign ID. We also have to provide a form to the user where he can change up values from an input field and request it after. So once again, let's define a new variable called form and let's set it equal to this create form. We need to pass in two parameters. The first one is the form type. So movie form type, colon, colon, class. And the second one is the movie that we want to show, which will be a variable movie. Before we work on our logic, let's return something to the user. So a view. So return this render. Inside the render method, we have two parameters. The first one will be the endpoint, movies forward slash edit.html.twig. Second one is an array. And inside the array, we have a key value pair of movie, which will be dollar sign movie, while the form will be our form create view. If we save it and navigate back to the browser and refresh our endpoint, you'll see that we're running into an error message. And that's because we're trying to print out our file type from the form type as a string, which does not work. Let's navigate back to the code editor and let's open our movie form type. Let's scroll down and let's comment out our entire image path just to see if this works. Save it, let's navigate back, refresh it, and as you can see, it does actually work. Let's navigate back and let's completely delete what we just commented out and let's redefine it one more time. So let's change the add method. What we want to add is the image path, which is a file type, like what we had before, colon, colon, class, comma, array method. Let's hit enter inside the array method where we need to define key value pairs. The first one will be required. It's not going to be required once a user wants to update something because it might be already there. Then we have mapped, which will be equal to false as well. Map means that we don't want to associate this field with entity properties. That's it for our form type. Now let's quickly edit our view because we don't want to use form tags, input tags, text areas, and so on. So let's delete everything from the form opening tag until the button. We do need the button and let's delete the form closing tag. Let's copy the button and let's actually start over, which is a bit easier. Let's add Twig snippets because we're going to start with a form underscore start and we're going to pass in the form that we passed in right here. Then we need to close it. So form end is form. Then we need to add our form widget. So form underscore widget of form. And right below of it, we're going to paste our button, which completely messed her up. All right. Save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome and refresh the page. And as you could see, the input fields are correct, but it somehow missed the styling. Oh yeah, I see why. Let's open the index, copy or extends, paste it at the top, save it. And I'll make sure that this works for you. And let's wrap this inside a block. All right, block body. I don't know where this went wrong. And right at the bottom, let's say, end block. Save it, navigate back, refresh it. 
you can see that the movie with ID number 14 has been added inside input fields as a values and we haven't even done that ourselves, which is awesome. Now let's focus on the logic of our controller. When editing an image, it could go either two ways. The image path we got is optional right here, since the image path has been set. What we want to is to double check if a user has submitted a new image. If it hasn't, we simply want to update the title, release here and description. Otherwise, we want to add the image path update as well. So let's handle that. We first need to make sure that we add another parameter inside our movies controller and the edit method because we're going to work with the request object. So let's say comma, request object, request. With the form object that we created, we need to make sure that we handle the request. So form handle request. It accepts the request that you want to handle, which is our object. All right. Then right below of it, let's define another variable called image path, which will be the value of the form we got. So form get, and we simply want to grab the image path value and let's get only the data from it. The edit method shows the form, but we do need to perform a check to see whether the submit button has been submitted or not. So let's create an if statement. Inside the if statement, we're going to check if the form is submitted. And so double ampersand, the form is valid. If it is, so if the form is valid, let's create a new if statement. And let's also add the else statement. The if statement will basically check whether the image exists. So let's add our variable image path right here, which will check whether it's true or not. If the image path does exist, we will handle image upload right here. But first, let's focus on the else statement because it's a bit easier. What we're going to do right here is simply persisting the title, release year, and description to the database. Inside our else statement, let's quickly add a DD right here because if you know me, I love to debug my application. Now let's say OK, save it. Let's navigate back to Chrome. Let's refresh it. Let's add five after Hulk. And without adding our image path, let's submit it. And right here, you can see that OK has been printed out, which will be the else statement. With the setters that have been provided by the entity, we could simply make a call to our setters and pass in the requested title, release year, and description. So inside the else, let's remove the DD. Now let's get our movie set title. Inside our set title, let's pass the form. We're going to get the title and we're going to chain the get data method to it. Now we need to do this two more times. So I'll do this real quick. Instead of saying set title, set release year, it has a form. It needs to get the release year and it needs to chain the get data method to it. Finally, we have our set description where we're going to get the form, get the description, and we're going to chain the get data method to it. This does not flush itself. So on the line below, let's say this EM, flush it yourself. If we try to perform it right now, the request will be handled, but the user will stay on the same page. So right below our flush method, let's return this, redirect to route, and we're going to move it back to the index page. Save it, let's navigate back, let's refresh it and click on continue. And as you can see, the title has been changed to Hulk 5. Now let's focus on the bigger work which will be the if statement where we need to update the image. Now I only have Hulk 5 on my desktop, so let's change Avengers right now. Let's edit the page. All right. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Inside the if statement, we first have to perform a couple if statements to see whether the image path is not empty and even check if the current file exists. So let's define the if statement where we first gonna check the image path, so movie get image path is not equal to null. By knowing this, you know that the row you are trying to edit has an image set. This might look like overkill since it is required to enter an image when creating a new post, but users are always guilty until proven innocent. 
So inside our if statement, let's create another one where we're simply going to see if the file exists, which is a PHP method. And what we're trying to check if this get parameter kernel dot project underscore there. Now let me actually align this on the line below. And this will basically be our local path. And let's concatenate the movie get image path. Then if the file exists, we're going to get the image path. So this get parameter, same as what we did before. We're going to check the kernel dot project underscore there. We're going to concatenate the movie get image path. Let me actually close off the sidebar, which is kind of overkill. We need to make sure that we define a new file name with a unique ID. Most users on the web have simple names for images such as image1, image2, image, and so on. So let's convert the uploaded image into something unique by saying, well, new file name variable is equal to unique ID. Let's concatenate a dot and let's concatenate the image path where we need to have the extension. Now what we're going to do next is identical to the create method, so the try catch. So let's copy our try catch. Now let's scroll to the bottom. Let's paste it right here. Right outside of our catch, we first got to make sure that we set the new image path. So let's say movie set image path. It needs to go inside the uploads folder forward slash and let's concatenate the new file name. We obviously need to flush it. So let's say this em flush. And finally, let's redirect a user by saying return to this redirect to route to the movies method. Save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Refresh it. Let's add a new image of Hulk. Submit it. And as you can see, Avengers has been changed to an image of Hulk. Just like editing a post, deleting a post works kind of in the same way, since you need to delete one single row based on the ID. If we click on the keep reading button and scroll to the bottom, you'll see a edit movie button that we've got right here, which will redirect you to a different page. When deleting an item, it does not work like that. You can't delete an item and still show it to the end user. So what we need to do is creating a delete method inside our controller which will handle the delete button and redirect us to the movies overview. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's open the sidebar and let's open the show.html.twig method. Let's duplicate our answer because it will basically be the same button but with a different color. The href will not be added but it will be delete. Instead of showing a green button, let's change it to red. And instead of saying edit movie, let's say delete movie. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to Chrome. Refresh it. We have our delete button, but let's add a little bit more margin. So let's say ML, margin left of six. Save it, navigate back, refresh it, and we have added a little bit more spacing. Now let's define our annotation and methods. So let's navigate back, open our movies controller. All right, let's define our annotations here by saying hashtag, brackets, route. Now the route will be exactly the same as what we added in our answer. So forward slash movies, forward slash delete, forward slash ID. Our route has methods. And this is kind of tricky because it has two. It has the get method to get one movie, but then it has a delete method to delete one row. Next to the methods, we also have our name, which will be delete underscore movie. Let's define a method right below called public function delete, which will return a response. All right. The delete method works based on an ID. So let's pass it inside the delete method. Now, based on the ID that we have right here, we got to make sure that we get the entire row from the database. So inside the delete function, let's say variable movie, which is equal to the movie repository that we got, which can be accessed by saying this movie repository. We're going to change one more method, which will be the find method that will search for a match inside the database based on the ID. 
and the ID is right inside of our method as an argument. Then the entity manager interface allows us to change the remove method to remove a row. So let's say this entity manager interface remove. And what we want to remove is a movie that we have found on the line above. Even with deleting, you got to make sure that you flush whatever you are doing. So let's say this em flush. Obviously we're deleting a row. So we got to make sure that we redirect a user. So let's say return to this redirect to route, which has a string inside of it of movies, which is associated with the index method that we have at the top right here. Save it, let's navigate back to Chrome, refresh the page. Let's click on delete. And as you can see, we just deleted a movie from our database. When it comes to web applications, securing incoming data is quite important. Symfony offers quite a few ways on how you could validate incoming data. You can either do it manually, or you can use the form type validation that we have already pulled in in the last few videos. If we try to create a movie right now, without adding values inside the input fields, so let's hit submit, you'll see that by default, Symfony Forms adds the required tag on an input field. Now this is all right when you create your low level applications, but it's not the most secure way. We're dealing with client side code right here, which is not the safest way. Therefore, it's always good to rely on security checks. A hacker can easily just remove the required tag from the input field and submit something empty, or even maybe something you don't want to see being submitted. Now the best possible place to start with your validation is right inside of your entity, where you can add something which is called a validation constraint on your properties. The reason why we start at our entity is because we want to validate an object once data comes in. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's open the entities folder and our movie entity. Now we've got our title, release year, description and image path properties and we honestly don't want to keep them empty. Now a quick note, you can add validation on public, protected or private properties, it doesn't matter. Inside the default annotations of our title, we've got our ORM, which is saying that the type is string and the length can maximum be 255. Now let's go right after it and hit enter. It already follows up with annotations. And let's start off with a simple check right here, where the title cannot be empty. So what we need to do is to say another add sign, assert, backslash, not blank, in Pascal case. Next to checking whether it can be empty or not, you can also define the minimum and maximum length of an input field. This can simply be done by adding another assert right after a not blank. So let's say at assert, backslash, length, which accepts parentheses right after it. And inside the parentheses, we should add a minimum or maximum. Now let's say that we want a minimum, which is equal to three. Now let's do the same thing for our release here, but only the not blank. So let's copy it and let's paste it right here. Also for our description, now let's do the same thing for our image path. We did just add assert constraints on our properties, but if we try to output it in the browser right now, our assert cannot be found since we need to make sure that we import it first. So let's navigate to the top and right below our doctrine use statement, let's add a new one of symphony backslash component backslash validator backslash constraints as assert. Adding this does not magically add validation on your model. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh the page, as you can see, it's giving us an error message and I can tell you why. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code and open our composer.json file, now let's search in here for something which is called assert. As you could see, no results have been found. So what we need to do is to import it through the CLI. So let's say composer require symphony forward slash validator space doctrine forward slash annotations. Let's hit enter. All right, it's pulling everything in. If we navigate back to Google Chrome, refresh the page, and as you can see, our create page is visible right now. Now, if we try to submit it one more time, you'll still see that the required tags are still available. So what we need to do is making sure that we turn the required attribute off. So let's navigate back, open our movie form type, and let's scroll up 
to our title. And right after our label, let's say required and the value is false. Well, let's copy it because we're going to add it for our release here as well. And also for our description and also for our image path. Save it. Let's navigate back, refresh the page, click on submit. And as you could see, we're getting an error message right here saying that the value should not be blank. Now, if we try to create a new movie, so let's say test, a release year of 2010 and a description of test. Let's choose an image. I've got Hulk again, submit it. And as you could see, we are able to create a new movie. Now the same thing goes for editing a movie. If we click on keep reading, scroll down, edit the movie. Now let's actually remove all values that we have and try to submit it. Now at the moment, we're getting an internal server error with a status code of 500, which is something you should try to avoid at all costs. Now what's going on right here? Since our forms of creating and editing looks exactly the same. If we navigate to our movie entity and scroll down to our setters, all right, I have my set title right here. You'll see that the set title is required to accept a string called title. This means that it is required to pass in a value and not null. And if we look at our error message, you see that we're passing in null right now. When you try to validate something, it will call the set title first or set release here and so on. In PHP, we can use nullable types. This can be done by prefixing the data type with a question mark. So right in front of string, let's add a question mark. Let's do the same thing for our release here. Description already has it because it's optional. And image path as well. Let's add it there as well. Save it. Let's navigate back to Chrome. Refresh the page. Click on continue. And as you could see, the value should not be blank has been printed out. Now the last validation that we added was for the title where we had a minimum length. So let's add two letters. Submit it. And as you can see, we're getting two error messages right now. The first one is the value is too short. And the second one is that it should have three characters or more. Setting up a basic user authentication system can consume a lot of time. Symfony has found a way to make an authentication system that's easy to use and understandable, but flexible enough to fix in a variety of settings. Whenever you want to use Symfony's authentication system, you need to pull in a package they created. So let's do that inside the CLI. Let's navigate to Visual Studio Code. Inside the CLI, let's perform the composer require symphony forward slash security dash bundle command. By default, Symfony projects provide tools for security. The command that we just performed is mainly for authentication and authorization. Before we dive into the actual code, I want to quickly let you know what the difference is between authentication and authorization, since these terms will get mixed up quite a lot. When you're talking about authentication, you're basically verifying who someone is and either allowing him to act as a person in your system. Think about the login and logout process. A user identifies himself in your application by logging in. And once a user wants to get out of your application, you'll be logging out. Authorization, on the other hand, determines whether the authenticated user is allowed to perform a specific behavior in your application. Even if we think about the project we created, any user can create a post, edit a post, and even delete a post. To hide those elements on a web page for certain users, authorization is needed. With the commands that we just performed, Symfony Console added a new command which allows us to create a new user in our application. If we perform the Symfony console inside the CLI, scroll up to the make section right here, you can see that Symfony allows us to make a new user. So let's test it out. Let's say Symfony console, make me a new user space. We can add one argument right there where we should define the name of our table. So let's say with a capital user. Hit enter. All right, let me zoom in for the next couple questions. At the moment, Symfony is asking us whether we want to store user data in the database through Doctrine. 
and that's actually what we want to do so let's say yes next up it's asking us if we want to change the default unique value of a user by default it's email but you can change it up to id username or even other properties that you'll like but i want to keep it equal to email now next up symphony is asking us if we want to hash incoming passwords in the time we're living right now you can't say no right here so let's say yes now if we scroll up inside the cli you can see that it has created two files for us which is the user entity the user repository it has updated the user entity and it has updated our security file so let me make the terminal a little bit smaller and let's start off with our user entity right here you can see that it's implementing the user interface and the password authenticated user interface now as you can see intellisense is throwing me an error but this should work because it's good code so don't worry about the red lines right here now we have a couple properties so our id email we even have our private rules which is an array which is awesome because a user can have a certain rule inside your application now we have our password and as you could see it is an hash password then we have our getters and setters and let me actually scroll down to the rules because this is probably the coolest thing about symphony's authentication scaffolding in my opinion the get rules method that we have right here is pretty cool you can add a default rule for every single user right here which is rule underscore user but you can change it up right here and what you can do later on in your application is basically saying well we have one admin in our application and the rest are all role users in order to wire the user entity with the authentication scaffolding it has updated the security configuration inside our application now this can be found inside the convict folder packages folder where you have a security.yaml file so let's open it i won't go over this file since it's mostly configuration but the most important addition right here is the password hasher section now the command that we performed inside the cli didn't create a migration for us so let's do that ourselves inside the cli let's perform symphony console make me a migration we're getting a warning so let's say yes to continue on all right it has been migrated all right it has created a migration for us now let's run it by saying symphony console doctrine colon migrations colon migrate it's asking us if we want to continue because it will overwrite values so let's say yes and it's asking us if we're very sure let's say yes again and all right this is pretty cool now let's open our database tool at the sidebar let's refresh our table and as you could see it has created a user table if we open it you'll see a user has an id email roles and passwords now let's define a user and we're definitely not going to use the database client tool for it since there's a cli command for it symphony allows us to make a registration form with one simple command inside the cli let's say symphony console make me a registration dash form let's hit enter all right it's going to ask us a couple questions first off it wants to know whether we want to use the user class that we just defined so let's say yes then it's going to ask us whether we want to add email verification i'm going to say no because i want to keep it very simple and adding email providers right now will cost us a lot of time so let's hit enter the next question is whether we want to automatically authenticate a user so let's say yes and once a user is authenticated we need to send them back to a route in our case let's say number one because we want to send it back to the movies endpoint which has a name of movies let's hit enter and as you could see we can go to the browser and open our forward slash register endpoint but before we do that let's talk about the other files that have been pulled in so let me close off my convict folder i don't need my public folder but i do need a new controller which is the registration controller now i'm not going over the code right here because it would just handle the registration part just pause the video and take a look at it and see what's going on right here then we got our register form type which will handle the input fields from the front end and finally it has created a view for us inside the registration folder where it has a file called the register.html.twig if we open it you'll just see our form starts form row 
we have a label, another form row, we have our button and our form end. Now, if we navigate back to the browser and open our forward slash register endpoint, you'll see a form right under my header. So let me actually turn that off. So let me delete it. All right, right here, but it has minimal styling. So what I've done before this video was creating the style so we could basically copy paste two pages and continue on with this tutorial. I've got my GitHub repository open, which will be linked in the description down below. And once you open it, open the templates folder, open the register.html.twig, copy it. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Select everything in the register.html.twig file and hit backspace and paste what we just copied. It's basically what we had before, but with a little bit more styling added to it. Now the second file will be the registration form type because our input field classes are defined right there. So let's go back to our static movies, open the source folder, form folder, and let's open the registration form type. Copy it, navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and let's open our, that was the wrong one, registration form type, select everything and paste what we just copied, Save it. Let's navigate back to Google Chrome. And I'm once again getting error messages of, I can't see them. Oh yeah, it's true, which is IntelliSense, which is not actually working quite good with Symfony. So let's navigate back to Google Chrome. Let's open our local host. Oops, it's throwing an error because it's using the wrong class. Let's replace admin with user. Save it. Let's navigate back. All right, and as you can see, our register screen looks a lot better right now. Now let's try to register an account. Let's add an email of admin at gmail.com and a password of admin1234 explanation mark. Let's agree the terms and click on register. I don't want to save my password. And as you can see, we have indeed been redirected to the movie's endpoint, but we can't really see a user or whatever that has been logged in. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's quickly open our users table and let's run it one more time. We have one new row with an email of admin at Gmail and a hashed password. The rules is empty because it has a default role and whenever you want to add a new, and whenever you want to redefine a new role for an admin, you can simply overwrite the value that has been defined right now. Now let's focus on the login part right now. Just like the register page, Symfony has a command that allows us to create a complete login scaffolding. So what we need to do is to go inside the CLI and say Symfony console, make me something which is called an auth. Hit enter. Now it's asking us whether we want to start from scratch or use their login form authenticator. So what I want to do is to use theirs. So let's say one, hit enter. The second question is the class name which will be login form authenticator. Hit enter. Then it's asking us what the name of our controller should be. By default, it is security controller. So let's say security controller. The last question is whether we want to have our logout endpoint. So let's say yes, because I definitely want to have that. Once again, this will mess up our styling. So I've also created the login route. So let's navigate back to our GitHub repository. Let's go to our root, templates folder, login folder, copy the code, navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the security folder, login.html.twig, select everything, delete it and paste it, save it. Now before we can actually log in, we need to change up one thing, and that's to redirect once a user logs in. Now I can actually show you what goes wrong right now. If we navigate back to the endpoint of login, this works. Now let's try to log in with an email of admin at gmail.com and a password of admin1234 explanation mark. Click on sign in. And as you can see, we're getting an error message right now because there is one to do left because Symfony said, well, you need to define where you want to be redirected to once you log in. So let's do that. Let's navigate back to the code editor. There is a new security folder inside the root. Let's open it with our login form authenticator. 
Now let's scroll down to the unauthentication success method that we have. And instead of saying throw new exception, let's copy what we have above and let's replace it with our exception. Instead of saying some route, let's say the movies route. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it and click on continue, you'll see that we have been redirected to the movies endpoint. Now you still can't really see if a user has been logged in or not. So let's double check that. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's open our index.html.twig file and somewhere right here at Twig snippets. Now in order to access your session, you need to write down app dot user, but the user is an array of the actual user. So what we can say is go deeper into our array by saying dot email. So print me out the email of the user. Save it, navigate back, refresh it. And as you can see, admin at gmail.com has been printed out. Now, if we navigate back for a second and remove our Twig snippet, save it and let's open our security controller. So right here at the top, we have a security controller. You'll see that at the bottom, we have our logout function. So let's make sure that we add this inside the URL. And once a user logs in, he has the opportunity to log out. Our menu has been stored inside the base.html.twig file. So let's open it. Let's scroll down, open the base.html.twig file. Let's navigate to the bottom. So to our last list item, which is contact, let's duplicate it on the line below. All right. For our endpoint right here, we're not going to forward slash contact. So let's remove it, but we're going to add a ternary operator right here after our forward slash. So let's add Twig snippets. What we want to check is whether our app dot user has been set or not. Question mark. If it has been set, print out log out. If the user has not been set, so colon, print out login. Now the same thing needs to be done for the contact text that we have. So let's remove it. Let's add Twig snippets. Let's see if app.user has been set, question mark. If it has, print out log out with capital L. If it hasn't, print out login. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, refresh it. You'll see that log out has been printed out. Let's click on it. Let's change our endpoint to forward slash movies. And as you can see, we're not logged in and login has been printed out in our menu. We've got quite some buttons on our pages that you usually don't want to show to users that are not logged in. Even right now on our movies endpoint, we have a create new movie button that you don't want to show to every user. It's quite easy to disable the button itself from the front end, but what about the back end? Now let's start off with the front end first. Let's navigate back to the code editor and let's open the index.html.twig file. And let's scroll down right here to our div where we have an enter of create new movie. Now let's copy the entire div and let's delete it for a second. And what we need to do is to wrap it inside an if statement. So let's write down if and hit app. Now the condition is pretty simple. We're simply going to check if the app.user has been set or not. If it has, let's go inside of it and print out the button that we just copied. And let me align it. All right. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, refresh it, you'll see that our button is gone. Now let's try to log in. So let's say admin at gmail.com, admin1234, sign in. And as you could see, the create new movie button is visible right now because we're logged in. Now the issue that we have right now is the fact that the movies create endpoint still works. So let's log out and let's go to the forward slash movies forward slash create endpoint. As you could see, we're still able to create a new movie. In PHP, you need to create some kind of method that will check whether a user is logged in. In Symfony, you can easily fix this by adding access control inside your security config file. So let's do that. Let's navigate back and let's open our config folder, the packages folder, where you can find a security.yaml file. If we scroll down, you will find somewhere a section right here called access underscore control. Let's uncomment whatever happens inside of it. Right here, you can see that the forward slash admin 
is only accessible for users that have a role of admin. Now let's change it up a little bit. What we want is the forward slash movies forward slash create endpoint. Now the role will not be admin, but the role will be basically role underscore user. Save it. Let's navigate back, refresh the page. And as you can see, we have been redirected to the login page. Now, if we try to log in, so admin at gmail.com, admin 1234 explanation mark, sign in, you'll see that we have access to the movies forward slash create endpoint. Now, this was it for this course. This was the last episode of it. Keep in mind that this project is not finished. You cannot deploy this project, well, just to test, but it is not finished. There are a lot of advanced topics that you can implement inside this course. What I've tried to do is teaching you the basic fundamentals of Symfony. Therefore, there are a lot of stuff inside the code that I just had to show you, but maybe not necessary for this course. And that includes for a lot of packages as well. So keep in mind, there is a lot that you need to change up right here. If you want to see me create more Symphony content, just let me know in the description down below. I'll happily do that. But for now, thank you for your time. If you do like my content and you want to see more, leave this video a thumbs up. And if you're new to this channel, please hit that subscribe button.